afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming down to Finance Fest. Uh, my name's Adam, I'm the owner here at Finance for Patrick. I just wanted to say thank you all for coming down. I uh, hope you've all had a good day. It's been really good. Uh, it's one of our highlights since we've been there. We're all sitting here in the area of the world. So um, we saw us here at all um, Finance Fest last year. Uh, we've all sort of pressed our stuff to that. It's a really, really interactive effort. Um, the Google Power at the end, Steve George, thanks for that. Uh, ask any questions as well. Um, so without further ado, can we get George on the stage? Let's get him on. Introducing Mr. George Farmer. Hey. Cheers, George. Thanks, Adam. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Adam, for inviting me again. Yes, this time last year, and the uh, event has grown, it seems. So congratulations on that. Uh, for me, um, these events uh, are really special because it's only when you have that genuine kind of human connection with aquascaping that you really understand what aquascaping is about. So it's a real privilege for me to be here. And I'm very grateful to be able to showcase uh, the wonderful uh, world of aquascaping to you guys. So no matter what your experience level or your skill level, hopefully by the end of this workshop, you'll have a, uh, a bigger understanding of aquascaping as a whole. Uh, you'll get to see, hopefully, a beautiful aquascape at the end. But more importantly, it's about um, not necessarily instructing how to aquascape, but um, even for the more experienced people, it's actually why we aquascape. You know, what is aquascaping about? It's, it's more than just a hobby to make a beautiful aquarium. There's actually a lot more kind of uh, deeper lessons that you can get from aquascaping, in my opinion, and definitely in my experience. So hopefully you'll get an essence of that uh, during the workshop about some of the benefits aquascaping can bring you and those around you. Um, it's, it's the most um, amazing hobby, really. It's more than, more than an art. It's more than a science. It's, uh, it's actually a connection with nature that you can bring into your home. You know, people have house plants or pets, um, you know, or, or even a garden, what aquascaping does, it combines so many different elements into one handy kind of glass box. You know, it's almost like a, a living three-dimensional sculpture. You know, we can kind of perceive the, uh, the aquarium itself as like a canvas, like a blank canvas as it is at the moment. And then we add our natural materials, we add our plants, and we're creating uh, a work of art that's not just beautiful to look at, but it actually grows and evolves. And you, as the aquascaper or the, the aquarium keeper, have a, a guiding hand in that. And so there's like a, a little bit of a God complex thing going on, I think. We have this sort of mini universe that we're in control of. And there's such a reward that you get from, from bringing you know, health and life and vitality into the aquarium. And then that, in return, can give you a sense of, of these things as well. So there's a real kind of interplay, a real kind of conversation, a dialogue going on between you, the creator, and the, the created. So it's a, it's a fascinating hobby. I love it, and I'm very privileged and lucky to be able to do this for a living. And I'm really grateful to be doing it in front of you guys today, uh, despite the, the northern weather. Um, if there's any questions throughout the workshop, please put your hand up or shout out. Uh, there will be a Q&A at the end. It is going to last at least two hours or so. Um, we're not going to be filling with water today. This needs to be transported upstairs. Uh, it, holds, it holds about 250 litres of water. So we'll just do the dry scape uh, today, but you'll get you know, more than enough kind of lessons from that. And then I'm sure Finest Aquatics will be uh, doing social media updates as it grows in, et cetera. So you can look forward to those. Um, a little bit of a shameless plug. This event is supported by Tropica Aquarium Plants, hence the polo shirts. They've kindly supplied all the plants for this aquarium and also for the three aquariums you see here from yesterday's scape off. Has everyone voted for their favorite yet? I think uh, I think I like the right hand one the best. That's not trying to influence anyone. 
I don't know who's that. Is that Stu's by any chance? I recognise this style. Yeah. And I guess that's Geordie Scapers on the left. And then down the middle. Was that right? Yeah. So a good example of this actually of, of aquascaping. You can see these beautiful creations. Unfortunately, the water is a bit cloudy, but you can get you get to see uh, different styles here, mostly rocks being used. So I've deliberately chosen a different type of rock today, and I'm going to go for quite a wood-heavy aquascape, which in my mind is more suitable for beginners. You can create a lot kind of more balance and aesthetic impact by using big pieces of wood. Uh, when you tend to use a lot of stone, you tend to need a little bit more experience getting the composition right to make it look more natural, in my view. You might, you might find it different yourselves. Um, but yes, it's going to be a, a good show. Hopefully you'll learn loads, have some good fun. Is there any kind of exper half-experienced aquascapers out there? Because I'll need some help preparing plants, if that's okay. Any, any volunteers? None at the front. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, it could be a couple of hours or so. Please feel free to ask questions. Uh, just a hand, hands up who's got an aquascape or planted aquarium at home already. Okay. Uh, and who uses CO2 injection? Just to get an idea. Okay, cool. Excellent. Okay, so it's going to be a lot of, um, obviously, hands-on practical guidance of how we do stuff. Also, we'll talk about some of the kind of techniques and some of the kind of um, rules and guidelines that we can use at home to create aquascapes yourselves. Maybe you can incorporate some of these on your own aquariums just by making a couple of subtle changes. We'll talk about the benefits of aquarium plants and how they can benefit the whole system. Uh, loads of ground to cover. And the most, most important thing for me, though, is to explain why, why should you aquascape? Why even bother? You know, why not just keep fish in an empty tank with plastic decor? You know, why, why do we want to keep these plants? Why do we want to uh, create this beautiful underwater uh, natural scene? I'm going to put the microphone down now. It's going to be really awkward just to work one-handed. So um, I'll try to shout at the, so people can hear me at the back, maybe my military, uh, <laughs> military pass might come into play a bit. And hello to the YouTube crowd as well. Okay, so uh, thanks for coming. Really appreciate it. And I know it's kind of lunchtime for a lot of people. There is a burger van, I think, around the corner if you get hungry. Uh, but yeah, hopefully you enjoy it and uh, we all learn something. Cheers. Oh. Okay, uh, can you hear me at the back? Yeah, perfect. Okay, so we'll talk about the actual system to start with. This is a, an Awaze Scaper Line 100. Uh, full disclaimer, I am an Awaze ambassador, so I will tell you how brilliant it is. It is actually a really good aquarium. As you can see, uh, rimless, uh, braceless, so you really um, getting a full kind of perspective of the aquascape. You can look into the aquarium. You can have woods coming out the top. Even plants can grow out of the top as well. Uh, a couple of disadvantages. You do get uh, the water evaporating much more quickly, and it can leave behind uh, some kind of scum marks as well. Um, but the, the trade-off is that you get this beautiful kind of blank canvas. It's kind of minimal. You know, we're really trying to look at what's inside the aquarium and not the aquarium itself. So rimless is the way to go for most uh, aquascaping kind of... Could you try again? Yeah, sorry, Siri. Siri, eh? A um, couple of unique features to the Escape Line 100. It does have mitered uh, corners here, so they meet at a 45-degree angle, and the, the silicon is minimal as well. So really trying to emphasize the aquarium itself and no distractions. Uh, the lighting is the Twinstar 900S, quite a high-end light, so looking at about 300 pounds or so for this, but it's full spectrum LED. It brings out the colors of the plants and the fish really well, and more importantly, it grows the plants really well. I use, I've been using these for a few years now, on and off, a proven performer, uh, highly recommended. Uh, we do have a frosted background here. This is kind of uh, a thin kind of vinyl wrap, if you like. I think it's... Is it frosted? Yeah, you can just see my hand through there. So that looks really great. We're kind of using the light there to bounce off here. It gives us really kind of ethereal, uh, infinite kind of background effect, which looks really natural. Um, alternatively, in aquascaping, we go for kind of this look. You can get illuminated LED backgrounds now as well. 
Another alternative is the black background, uh, which is great for contrast. So they're normally the three kind of backgrounds that we go for uh, when we're aquascaping. Uh, I did say it was a scaper line 90, the nice 100 actually. It's 100 centimeters by 50 by 50. And I think it's 10 mil glass. We've got the cabinet here as well. It's a bit dirty, so never mind. Um, it does have a unique feature here with the, if you're using the Biomaster external canister filter, uh, it has a pre filter which you can maintain really easily and actually has a sliding drawer here so you can really easily maintain your filter. It needs to come out the top, you see. So if you didn't have that drawer, it's just a bit more impeded. Got shelf there for all your maintenance kit, etc. CO2 bottle, which we'll use later. So really high quality system, cabinet, tank, and lighting. Uh, I'd recommend uh, probably an Oazo Biomaster uh, 600 or a Biomaster 850 on this. So you're looking for about five or 10 times the aquarium volume turnover per hour. So if this is 200 liters, ideally you're looking at around 1,000 to 2,000 liters per hour filtration. So that's the equipment in a nutshell. Um, CO2 we'd inject in here. I'll probably go for inline CO2. So the diffuser's fitted in line with the filter outlet. So what happens is those CO2 micro bubbles are part of the outlet hose and they get fired around the aquarium. And those CO2 bubbles will just feed those plants really well. You know, plants photosynthesize, so they use light and CO2 to grow. If we didn't use CO2 injection, the plants would just have to use that low level background CO2 that's already in the water, which is actually a very, very low level. So the plants don't grow so quickly or some plants won't even grow. You know, some plants really need to have CO2 in order to thrive. Um, is it possible to get a drink of water? Is there any members of staff around here? Yeah, thanks, mate. Um, any questions so far on the equipment? Very, relatively straightforward. No? Good. So let's start aquascaping. <laughs> That's why we're here. Uh, we've got some soil here. First thing I usually do is put the soil in. I'm not going to use any kind of sand, gravel, or anything like we've got here. Some people have used some cosmetic sand, like Make a Pathway, as you can see on the left and the right. I'm just going to go for a 100% soil substrate today. This is Tropica Aquarium soil, as you can see. Proven performer, probably used this in over 100 aquascapes over the years. And it's designed just to be kind of used on its own. Uh, you don't need to use any like uh, nutrient rich base layer or anything like that. It will, you can use the nutrition capsules if you like to really get some uh, extra food in those plants. But it does contain a lot of nutrients already to help feed the plants. And it also buffers the water as well and reduces the water hardness and pH. So you look at it around pH 6, 6.5, keeps it quite stable at that and it reduces the hardness as well. So it makes, it, it makes the water kind of more suitable for most aquarium plants and most, most tropical fish and shrimp as well. I live in a really hard water area. I think it's soft here, is it? You're lucky here because the water is quite soft. Uh, but this is really good for if you live in a hard water area because it, it does bring that hardness down a touch. You can experience, uh, sometimes you might get an, an ammonia spike with this. It's very uh, high in uh, nitrogen compounds, including ammonia. So plants like to use nitrogen as one of the food sources, which is one of the reasons plant... Uh, a uh, well-planted aquarium is really good for water quality because it will use the fish ammonia and nitrite and nitrate as food. Uh, what you can do with a new soil is you can experience an ammonia spike. Uh, so during that, pro during that period, obviously, you don't want to be adding any fish. Ammonia is really toxic. But it's good news, if you, especially if you're using a, a brand new filter. That, that ammonia is going to help seed the filter. It's going to help mature that filter. So after a couple of weeks or so, you can then begin adding your livestock. And then if you're planted really heavily, those plants are going to... Uh... Gotcha. Did you try again? 
Sorry, my Apple Watch keeps trying to talk to me. It's actually dictate. It's actually dictated everything I've just said. <laughs> it's crazy. Um, so, what was I saying? Yeah, you can add fish and shrimp probably two, three weeks after initial setup. Do test for ammonia and nitrite in particular. Uh, you want those to be undetectable really before you add any livestock. Um, but the good news is the plants uh, will happily use any nitrogenous, wa nitrogenous waste from the livestock. So it's, like I say, one of the reasons I, I really like to plant really heavily in my aquariums. It just really boosts the overall water quality. The plants produce oxygen. They take in harmful toxins such as nitrogen, uh, heavy metals, etc. And it just really really makes a beautiful home, not just to look at, but it's beneficial for all the inhabitants of your aquarium. Okay, do another bag, I think. So I've got a lot of questions about how long does this last? Well, it will last for years and years. Um, the nutrient content is, is, can be limited, but what I always say is, uh, use a soil and you use a liquid fertilizer as well as a soil and then what happens is the plants will use nutrients through its roots through the soil but also through its leaves through the liquid fertilizer so you're really kind of spoiling the plant you're giving the plant loads of kind of loads of food loads of nutrients that the plant needs to grow and stay healthy so I always recommend using a decent substrate and a decent liquid fertilizer as well at the same time so if you're using a liquid fertilizer, the, the actual nutrient content of the soil will last a lot longer because the plant will be taking in its food through its leaves as well. So it won't be so hungry through, it as, through its roots. Hopefully that makes sense. So top tip when we're doing our soil, we like to kind of slope it slightly to the back if we can, slightly shallower at the front. And then that gives it like an enhanced sense of depth. Some people have fancy tools to do it. I just like to use my hands. <clears throat> so we look, it's not a cheap substrate system. You're looking at, for a nine liter bag, which was the big bag we used earlier. I think you're looking at about 35 pounds or so. And that's suitable for like a 60 liter aquarium. Um, but, you know, if you're serious about growing healthy plants, it's almost like, a, I wouldn't say an essential thing, but you're definitely kind of investing, you know, in that, in that whole system to promote the healthiest plant growth possible. You know, and the, the better you look after those plants and the more plants actually you have, the less chance of algae you have, you know. Most people have had algae at some stage in their life. Most people get frustrated with it. Um, but the good news is, you know, if you set up your aquarium properly with the right equipment, choose the right plants and enough of them, and then look after them in the right way by maintenance, then algae should never really be a problem. And if you do get any algae, it'll just be like a low-level background algae, which, which is natural. You know, don't be, some aquascapers in particular get obsessed about having zero algae. Well, in my mind, you're just setting yourself up to be a bit sad. <laughs> you know, just accept that you're going to get a little bit of algae. As long as it's not kind of taking over the aquarium and spoiling the view, and a little bit of algae is okay. So don't be too hard on yourselves. Okay, I've got a couple more. I've got little, little bags here, so I'll probably need a couple more of these. <clears throat> Ah, got the powder. This is a good talking point. Lovely. Okay, uh, this is the aquarium soil powder. So it's identical to this product, it's just a smaller grain size. So I like to use this as a top layer. Um, because of its fine grain, it, look, it looks kind of nicer. 
and it's ideal for planting really delicate, delicate rooted plants. So we're going to be using some tissue culture plants later, which are basically baby plants. They're very, very small roots. So the, the small grain size is much more suitable for those really kind of delicate roots. So put a couple of these in and then we're probably good to start the hardscape. There are a lot of other soils out there on the market. ADA Aquasoil is very popular, Amazonia. Uh, there's other brands as well. They're all actually very similar. Uh, they're basically like pelletized volcanic ash mixed in with a load of nutrients. And they, they, all, they all kind of do the same thing. They all reduce the water hardness, pH slightly. Hopefully they all contain some nutrients as well. Some brands more than others. But in my mind, in my experience, uh, the Tropica is a very safe bet, very stable product. It doesn't require rinsing either. You know, I'm sure some of you have installed a, a new aquarium with sand or gravel, put your water in, it's just a cloudy mess, you know. Uh, this stuff, if you fill up very slowly, we're not going to do that today. Um, but I like to use a, I'll show you. When you're filling up, you can just fill it nice and slowly with like a kitchen colander that disperses the water and you don't kind of cause any real cloudiness. So top tip for you, especially in a new, new aquarium. Okie dokie. Substrates in, try to slope it a little bit to the back. We are going to mess it up a little bit because we're moving the hardscape around, but we'll try to make it look nice and neat for now anyway. Okay, any questions on the substrate? No? Good. Do my job very well then. <coughs> This make you smart stuff. Smart water. What is, it, what is it about it makes you smart then? Trust me. Okay. All right, we're going to talk about hardscape now. One of my favorite parts of the aquascaping process. Uh, the hardscape is like the skeleton. Uh, if you look at the aquarium as like a human body, if you think of the hardscape like the skeleton, it's like the, the structure which everyone, everything else is kind of formed around. So if we start off with a very strong hardscape, which is the wood and the rocks, we have a strong skeleton, and then we can build up on that skeleton with the muscles and the flesh, which are the plants. So you can kind of think about your aquascape in different ways. You know, you can think about it as a blank canvas, a work of art. You can think about it as a human body. You know, it's, uh, yeah, lots of metaphors. So... I'll start off with the wood, I think. So we could use the rocks first and then the wood or vice versa. But I think the wood is gonna be the most dominant element. So we'll start off with that. I'm just gonna slide this light all the way to the front. And what I like to do, I think this is called Redmore Root. And ideally what would happen is, I, these would be pre-soaked in water for several weeks to ensure that it doesn't float. Um, what will happen is, uh, if I put this in right now as it is, plant everything, fill up with water, that's just gonna float up, dislodge all the soil, all the plants are gonna float up and it's gonna be a disaster. So what we would do normally is pre-soak it. We can't do that today because it's not, you know, I haven't had the time. Uh, but what I would normally do maybe is either glue it to the glass base using uh, super glue, and what you can use is, um, I don't advocate smoking, but you can get cigarette uh, filter tips, which are like a cotton fiber uh, material. And then what you do is you can break those open and then you can um, kind of push it against the, the glass and the wood and then use super glue. And then what happens is that forms a solid kind of adhesive, almost like a, a cement. 
and you can glue things together like that. So what I might do is I might do that later with the with the rocks. So when I put the rocks around the woods, I might use that technique uh, later. I do have some glue and I have some I do have some cigarette uh, filter tips, but I don't smoke, but especially if my wife's watching. Yes. Okay. So start off with the biggest piece of wood. This is going to be our kind of main focal point. And then what we we'll like to do is kind of experiment what looks the most natural position. And we can see already that this has kind of been sawn, We've got artificial, obviously, cut points there. We don't want to see those ideally. They look unnatural. What we're trying to do is create a natural looking aquarium. You know, we're creating a, what we call a nature style aquascape today based on the nature aquarium principle uh, from a guy called Takashi Amane. Some of you may have heard of him, a Japanese guy. Uh, sadly passed away in 2015, um, but he was like the pioneer, I would say, of modern aquascaping. You know, he gave us this new way of looking at aquariums, you know, from just an aquarium with some plants in to actually a, a slice of nature, you know, that represents nature, you know, something that can be inspired from a, an outside uh, landscape or seascape, a forest scape. Um, a mountain range, you know, you can see here these three great examples of nature aquarium style. You know, even Iwagumi, which translates from Japanese to basically mean rock garden. You know, this is still nature aquarium. We're, we're using those lessons from nature outside and then we're transposing those into the aquarium inside. But we're using a, a lot of wood today. This is called the Ryoboku style. If I was using a lot of stone or just purely stone, we'd, use, we'd call that Iwagumi style. So a couple of Japanese terms for you there. But really good idea to select appropriate pieces of hardscape for your aquarium. So what, what do I mean by appropriate? Well, think about the size, you know, the size of the woods, make sure it fills the aquarium nicely. You know, if we just had a, a, one small piece of driftwood in here with no height to it or anything, it would just be drowned out by all the plants. So we want to start off, like I said at the beginning, like a strong skeleton, like a nice structure to give impact and also hopefully to look natural as well. So what I do now is kind of look at the woods in all kind of angles, all axes, and, and kind of figure out and trying to imagine and visualize in my mind how it's going to look in the longer term once the plants are grown in and the, and the stones are in place. So I think this, this position here looks quite nice. We've got the main kind of weight of the wood here, almost central. And then we've got these kind of dangling roots coming out here, coming forward. I think that it's quite natural. And we've got a couple of nice branches coming up there. And, that, and if it comes out of the top of the aquarium, that's really cool. I quite like breaking the surface, just adds that extra sense of nature. So we'll just pop that in. Like so for now, we can always fiddle around with it later. But you can see already that's given us a nice impact. Um, thinking about composition, composition means, you know, how are the objects kind of uh, located, you know, in terms of how, how far left, how far right, how far up and down they are. How is the main kind of focal point composed? Where does it sit within the frame? So we've got the, the main kind of weight of the wood here. And a classic thing would be to position it directly centrally. And that would be nice for like an island style. So we have like the main weight here. We could do tall plants around the center and then smaller, shorter plants around the edge. And we create this like nice island composition. Or if we wanted to, we could go a bit crazy, but all the way to the left like this. And then deliberately have tall plants to the left, shorter plants to the right. <laughs> And then that's going to create a triangular composition. And then the other one, if we sort of laid it down a bit, maybe like this. It's not going to work. If I had another piece of wood over here, and then we had tall plants to the left and right, shorter plants uh, to the center, you know, hardscape heavy to the left and right like this. Then we have the U shape composition. So there's three main compositions, island, triangular, and U-shape. 
in, in basic aquascaping terms. Hopefully all that makes sense. So I'm gonna have a little, just a little play now with this and see what I think looks best. We'll put another piece in, go for the second largest piece. What you wanna do is normally use the same type of wood. So if you're using multiple pieces, try to use the same type. Otherwise it just looks unnatural. You know, we're trying to create a coherent theme within the aquascape. So if I used a bit of Mapani wood, which is uh, a lot different texture, a lot of different color once it's, uh, once it's wet as well, it'll just look a bit odd. And the same with the rocks as well. We don't necessarily want to be using more than one type of rock. So I'm just, again, having a look at the woods. What's, what position is it going to look the most natural? How is it going to kind of complement this piece? And that now it becomes almost like an impossible infinite jigsaw puzzle. You know, you are working in three dimensions, three axis, X, Y, and Z. You know, got multiple pieces, all kind of uh, balancing with each other. And the job of us as the aquascapers try to come up with a solution to this infinite puzzle. Because there is no solution. There is no, like, right answer. The answer is what you think looks best. And you can only achieve that once you've kind of experimented you know, that can take days, weeks, some guys will take months, you know, composing their hardscape with some really intricate kind of designs. We haven't got months today to do that, so hopefully I'll get it done in a couple of minutes. <laughs> so I'm going to try to sort of balance with this piece here. I quite like... Uh, yeah, I think I quite like it there, just off-center. And then... <clears throat> Yeah, that kind of flows into that there, across there, and that's the same size as that, so that fits, I think. Let's have a look. So I've been doing this for 20 years now, so hopefully, um, you know, with practice, everything gets a little bit easier, and I can kind of visualize in three dimensions, hopefully, how it's going to look before I put it in, and hopefully that will be nicely balanced. There, that kind of interlocks in there, like so. Yeah, I'm quite happy with that. It's quite a kind of jungle, twisty, rooted vibe, which I quite like. And it suits the plants uh, that we've got today. So, yeah, I'm happy with that. We've got one more piece. I'm not sure if we need it. It's going to take up a lot, of, a lot more room. And I like to plant really heavily, so I like to save some space in the soil for the planting. So the other thing is we take out that piece or that piece and try this piece instead. But I'm going to go with my gut instinct, and I think that's okay. Okay, I need to drink some more smart water. Oh, shut up. Any questions on the wood? I think this is Redmore root. You guys call it Redmore root. Uh, more than likely, uh, when you're using brand new red moor roots, after a week or so, you'll probably see like a biofilm, like a white fungal growth on the wood. Nothing to worry about. Uh, you can just brush it off with like an old, not an old toothbrush, but a toothbrush that's dedicated to your aquarium, obviously. Um, shrimp will eat it as well. It's, it's perfectly harmless. Just looks a bit ugly, obviously. But yeah, don't worry about it. Once it's brushed off, siphon it away as part of your water change and then it probably won't come back again. Um, if you're using moss in an aquascape, in a brand new aquascape, I prefer to wait a few weeks for the wood to like really get soaked, leach any of its stuff off, and then put the moss on after that, because what can happen is the moss can get a little bit contaminated, uh, and moss is actually quite a high maintenance plant as well. So once it kind of gets contaminated, it's quite hard to kind of rescue it if you like. So I normally add moss to a mature aquascape, especially uh, once hopefully got some shrimp in there and the shrimp will love to graze on the moss uh, keep it uh, keep all those fronds you know clean and stop any kind of excess algae or detritus build up so if you do go for moss wait maybe a few weeks before you add any and then hopefully add some uh, cherry shrimp or amano shrimp to help to help keep it clean we're not using moss today okay now it's time for the rocks um, I think this is, is this petrified, what do you call this, petrified? Lots of different brand names out there for, for the same 
type of product, but I think this is called petrified stone or petrified rock here. Really beautiful, um, very dense. I don't believe this adjusts the water chemistry like some rocks can, like Syriou stone or mini landscape rock. This can. Uh, this is basically like a limestone, which will uh, potentially boost your pH and hardness. But I think this is relatively uh, inert, so perfect to use straight away. You might want to give it a rinse off in water, just to rinse off any dust, etc. Um, but again, similar process to the wood. I'm just looking at it in all angles. You know, what's the most attractive side? What, what, what side do we want to look at? You know, what side's the most uh, kind of boring and that will face away from us? And then what angle do we want to put it at? We want to make it look quite natural. We want to have some impact. So if I had it like this, it'd be quite nice, but it's actually taking up a lot of real estate, a lot of soil space, which I like to use for planting. Uh, if we had it like this, it adds a bit more impact. We can actually bury it in the soil as well, so it won't look so unnatural. So you can see this bit is kind of like a U shape. We can obviously bury it in the soil. It'll be nice and flat, and then we'll just have this bit exposed here, which I think would look quite nice. And we want to be kind of using, our, remember we talked about composition earlier, where are the things situated, you know, along to the left and right. We have a thing called the rule of thirds, <coughs> excuse me. So your main focal point, we tend to like put off center by a third. So if you split your aquarium into kind of three equal sections, then we can just kind of locate this either to the left or to the right. Excuse me. I think there's a nice little area here where this will hopefully kind of fit. And then we want to kind of think about, you know, do we want it completely upright? Do we want to kind of lean it a little bit? Do we want to lean it forward? You know, have a little think about that. I won't want to lean it forward because that's going to create shade from the lights and then the plants underneath probably won't grow so well. Uh, I don't want it quite super upright because it looks a bit unnatural. So what I'll do, I'll lean it back a little bit. And uh, I think this area here is going to be perfect for that. And then what you can do, really clever, is actually bury a little bit of the wood as well under the stone. And that's going to help avoid that wood floating when we do fill up with water. And then if you can, you can like just move that soil up to the base of the stone. It just looks really natural now. It looks like the, you know, the stone's been there for thousands of years. The earth eroded away and exposed that stone. Okay, we'll go for the next stone now. This is a nice bold piece here. And the same process, what's the most attractive side? You also want to consider, does it match? Does it kind of look coherent with this piece? So this particular rock has like a very light area here and then a very dark area here. So you want to kind of think about that, you know, does it kind of balance nicely with this? We think about the strata as well. The strata is these natural lines that you can see running through the rock, and you can use that to your advantage. So if you're doing, especially if you're doing like an iwagumi, a rock only, you really want to be paying attention to the strata because you want to make the most kind of natural look. So you won't want necessarily all the strata kind of, you know, looking random. You know, in nature, the strata will probably flow a certain way, you know. Or if you wanted to create deliberate tension, so for instance, if you had sort of three stones and all the strata is facing the same way, you get this nice flow. But if you wanted to create some deliberate tension, you could actually have, you know, one stone strata facing that way and then a, another one facing this way. And if you have them at a 90 degree angle, it actually creates a really kind of nice, almost like a visual tension to add a bit more interest to your layout. So talking a bit more advanced techniques there, but hopefully it's all good. Okay, I think that looks nice like this. So again, I'm gonna try and maybe bury a little bit of the wood to prevent it from floating. We are, we are gonna plant around the stone as well. So even if it doesn't look quite natural, there's a bit of a gap here. 
but that's okay. I'm going to plant some uh, probably starogyne around here, which will cover that up, that gap up. So the good thing about your hardscape, there is a bit of room for forgiveness. If it's not like perfectly composed or you don't have the perfect piece, you know, we're going to be planting. So the plants can actually kind of give you some room for error. You know, you can cover areas of the wood with plants or the rock with plants. We can plant obviously around the base. You know, and as the aquascape grows, as those plants fill out, you know, a lot of this hardscape is going to become invisible in the long term. So don't get kind of too upset if your hardscape doesn't look absolutely 100% as you would wish right from the start. It, you know, the whole thing is going to evolve considerably over the weeks. Okay, so we've got two pieces of stone in there. We very rarely use odd numbers with big rocks like this because it just looks too symmetrical. So your kind of eye doesn't know whether to look left or right. It doesn't really settle. So we'll add another stone, a smaller stone, over to the left here to give it some balance. So we'll probably, this is an interesting one here. It's a beautiful texture on that here. So it would be nice to see that if possible. In fact, it's, it's quite nice all the way around. Yeah, I think like that. And again, if we're going to try and lean it against the wood a little bit, stop it from floating, hopefully. <clears throat> okay, I think we're almost there. I'm not quite 100% happy with this, this rock here. So maybe. Very similar height to this one, so your eye is kind of going along and it's a little bit boring. So I'm going to try this one. It kind of complements this one a little bit better. There's a lot of trial and error, you know, in aquascaping, especially the hardscape stage. But it is worth taking your time to make sure you're really happy with it. Um, smartphones are really good, so you can you can create a layout like this, and you can take a photo. And you could try a different one, take a photo, take, and then keep playing around till you've got as many iterations as you like. And then flick through your photos. And then when you see it in two dimensions, this is obviously three dimensions. When you see it in two dimensions on your phone, you actually get a much more instant like impression of how good it looks. So there's a top tip for you. Okay, this side's definitely more interesting than that side. Go for that. <clears throat> Okay, we've got this gap under here, but that's going to be covered with plants, so you won't see that. But I've deliberately kind of sloped it upwards a touch, gives it just a bit more of a natural feel. You can see this one is kind of going up a bit. This one's kind of leaning towards, so we're really, we've got this kind of natural flow of the stone towards the centre of the scape. Plenty of room for planting as well. Good. I'm happy with that. Okay, that's the hardscape done. <clears throat> Any questions on hardscape? That's good. I don't know how much the how much this kind of would cost. Any ideas? The Redmore root and the stones all together. Yeah, so you're looking around 100 quid, 120 quid for the hardscape there. Might sound like a lot of money. Uh, you know, I'm not going to deny that. But, you know, you're creating uh, something to live with and something that's going to hopefully reward you with many, many hours, days, months, weeks, months of pleasure. So, you know, if you do have the money to invest, then I would definitely recommend, you know, investing in really good quality hardscape if you can, if you can manage that. You can potentially get stuff from outside, although I would always recommend buying it from a store. You know, it's going to be guaranteed to be aquarium safe. You won't have to treat it so much, etc. cetera. Um, but yeah, there are ways to save money, of course. But yeah, really great example. Redmore root and petrified, is it petrified wood or fossilized? There's loads of different.
names for it, petrified rock, petrified wood. It's actually a fossilized wood, so it's a rock, but it's uh, based, based on a wood that's kind of been compressed over thousands and thousands of years, and that's why it's kind of turned into a stone, basically. Yeah, it should do. No, no, once this, it only comes around once usually. Yeah, so definitely worth, if you've got space in your garden, like a water, rain butt or something, then, or a bath. <laughs> Um, yeah, definitely try to try to soak it if you can. If you if you add if you have a container big enough uh, and you have the ability to, then if you boil the water, uh, then that's going to speed up the whole process even more. You can boil, you know, you could get it to sink almost immediately if you boiled it for a couple of hours or so. Otherwise, it can take weeks uh, in cold water to really sink. Uh, but yeah, we haven't got time to soak it today, obviously. So hopefully, just by putting those stones on top, that's going to help keep it down. What I'll say to the guys, once they've moved it upstairs, they, they could probably just put a couple of rocks on the top here when they fill up with water to stop it from potentially floating. Um, I've done a workshop before, and we filled up, and then it was a disaster because the wood floated, and yeah. But we're not filling up with water today, unfortunately. And that will be done later in the week. Are you all local? Is everyone local here? We can come back and obviously see this in the longer term. I don't know if these are going to be, are these going to be kept going in the long term? Raffled up. Raffled up, nice. What's everyone's favourite? Stews. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. It's nice, isn't it? All tropical aquarium plants, of course. The best from Denmark. I was there last week, actually. So uh, yeah, very grateful uh, to them. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, moss moss will do uh, quite well in the shade. Um, other plants like Anubius as well. Uh, Anubius actually and Ambuca philandra. Uh, they're so slow growing that if you give them too much light, then you tend to get algae growth on the leaves. So yeah, definitely consider planting plants like that in the shade. Cryptocorini species as well, crypts do well in the shade. Um, yeah, we'll talk more about plants in a minute, actually. We can go through all those. But yeah, that's the hardscape complete, kind of classic uh, sort of island in a way, because it's kind of more kind of concent uh, central kind of, it's almost like, a, yeah, definitely like an island principle. Although by the time we've got the plants in there, it's going to be quite, um, Actually, yeah, we might go island, you know. Yeah, island. It's an island composition. Yeah, so stick with that. Okay, time for planting. So all plants kindly supplied by Tropical Aquarium Plants. Got a classic mix that I love to use, especially in workshops. Most of them are easy category. So Tropica have three categories, main categories of plants. And this refers to their difficulty level. So we have easy, which are the, you can really see quite easily there, are the green labels. And then you have medium category, which are orange. And then you have advanced category, which are red. We don't actually have any advanced category as far as I know today. I tend not to use advanced category. These are like uh, the most difficult type of plant. They need lots of CO2, lots of nutrients, good circulation, lots of light, and they're high maintenance. So advanced plants are for, you know, advanced aquascapers, really. Um, not to kind of put you off, but, you know, give them what they need, you know, good light, good CO2, et cetera. And there's no reason why you can't succeed with advanced plants. But I like to use easy plants, a medium, a push, just because I think you can create beautiful layouts with easy plants. You know, I love to use Anubias, Crips, Ferns. You know, all these are suitable for almost any aquarium. You don't necessarily need CO2 injection. You certainly don't need a lot of light, you know, and I'd argue that almost any kit aquarium you can get on the market, you can grow most easy plants with that kit with no additional extras. So, you know, no matter what aquarium you've got at home, potentially, as long as you, the fish don't eat the plants, you can probably succeed with a lot of the plants that we've got here today. And we'll talk about each species in more detail in a minute. So that's the kind of three categories, easy, medium, advanced. And then we've got kind of foreground, midground, background plants. Obviously, the 
background of the tallest, foreground of the shortest. And then finally, we've got our attaching, attaching plants, or some people call them epiphyte plants. These are plants that you attach to the hardscape or the decor. And we put those in last usually. So I'll start off with the foreground plants. And they are, where did I put there? One, two grows here. So I'm just gonna cover these temporarily. Put it in for time, that's okay. Important to not let your plants dry out too much. That's why we've got the spray bottle here. This is particularly important. If your plants are adapted to grow under water already, um, most plants are grown in greenhouses, actually grow out of water. Um, most plants are amphibious, so they can either grow out of water or underwater. Uh, once a plant's adapted to grow underwater, it's very susceptible to drying out. So if you have a, a plant that's kind of tall up here in a mature setup and you're doing a big water change, you know, you don't want to let that plant dry out too much. It, it can damage the tissue and it can like really struggle. So just be mindful of, of that. We're going to use foreground carpeting plants here. This is a beautiful selection from Tropica. And these are tissue culture. These are grown, these are called one, two, grow. Uh, these are grown in our uh, state-of-the-art laboratories in Denmark, uh, literally producing hundreds, thousands, if not millions of these a year. And they're grown in sterile conditions. So they're guaranteed to be free from algae, uh, snails, snail eggs, pesticides, disease, they're absolutely pure baby plants. Um, and although they're very small, they're baby plants, uh, you actually get a lot more quantity a plant in here versus a regular potted plant. So a good example here is a Cryptocorini undulatus broadleaf. There's probably 20 or 30 individual plants in there. Whereas if I showed you a pot, it's a different species. And it's obviously a lot bigger at the moment, but there's probably only 10 or so there. So you're looking at anything, depending on the species, you can get sort of three to 10 times the quantity of plants with the one, two grow versus a regular pot. Now, most newcomers or beginners will probably see that and that, and they probably want to choose that because it's bigger, it's more instant impact. Uh, but however, the one, two grow has so many advantages over this. Do you want to know what those advantages are? I'm going to tell you anyway. So, you get more quantity, like we said, guaranteed to be free from algae, snails, pesticides, disease, etc. And, and a really important one is, it's, these are grown in like a liquid uh, growth media here. I don't know if you can see that in the video, mate. So this is a really special media. This is a really high in nutrients, plant food and growth hormones. And it basically is the kind of you think of a baby growing, it's like the embryotic, embryotic fluid, you know, the, the stuff that really keeps that baby alive. That's what this liquid is. Now, the great thing about this is that the plant is actually already adapted to grow underwater. Okay, so as soon as you put this plant in your aquarium, it's going to adapt straight away and start growing. Okay, and it will give you a much better chance of success at that startup phase. Now, if you put this, this is a potted plant. This is grown in the, in the greenhouses in Tropica, in Denmark, and these are grown hydroponically, okay? So that means that the, only the roots here are wet, okay? And they, they're grown on special big tables, and you have this water circulating around the table, and the plant gets all of its food from that water, that nutrient-rich water, and the plant grows out. It grows out into the air. This isn't a submersed plant, okay? This is a, what we call an emerged plant. It's growing in the air. And that's, that has some advantages, you know, because it has to support its own weight in the air. It's quite robust physically, so it's better for transportation. Um, it looks good, doesn't it? You know, it's tall already. It looks like a plant. Whereas that, you know, what, what does that look like? You know, it's a bit like, it's a bit small. But what happens is this, we plant this today, obviously. And what, what can happen is because this is adapted to grow out of water, it will actually take some time and energy to adapt to grow underwater because it's been grown out of water. And the plant has to use a lot of kind of its own energy source, 
And as it does this, it can kind of struggle sometimes. And you'll get like melting plants, you'll get plants that drop leaves. Uh, and this leaves the plant open to algae issues. Your algae is really attracted to unhealthy plants. So unless you've got a real optimum water conditions, you know, a lot of plants can struggle to adapt straight away to underwater growth, okay? So the advantage, the big, in my mind, one of the biggest advantages of the one to grow is that it doesn't have to go through that transition. It doesn't have to adapt to grow underwater. It's ready to go straight away because it's grown in this liquid. Does that make sense to everyone? It's quite a, a fundamental thing. A lot of people are put off by these because they are tiny, aren't they? You know, let's get it out of there. You know, it's relatively small. It's a couple of inches high at the most. You know, you're looking at a good sort of seven, eight inches there. But trust me, in literally a few days, maybe not, not a few days to get that size, but a couple of weeks, and this is potentially going to reach this size, whereas a couple of weeks, that's barely adapted to start growing yet, okay? So these really are, you know, a, a huge advantage over these. A lot less energy to produce these as well if you're kind of a bit more environmentally conscious. You know, you actually, the CO2 footprint for these is a lot lower than producing these potentially as well. So, you know, lots of different advantages there of the one, two, grow. Uh, we've got the potted and the one, two, grow today. If I just use one, two, grow throughout the whole aquascape, it'd be great, but it'd look a bit boring, you know, because they're all going to be tiny. So I like to mix it up a little bit for workshops. But if I was at home, I would literally use 100% the one, two grows if I could. You know, we've all probably experienced pest snails, haven't we? Yeah. It's guaranteed. No, if you use 100% of these in your aquarium at home, nothing else, no other types of plants, fresh soil, fresh hardscape, absolutely no chance of snails. Okay. Or, or algae at the beginning. Okay, I think we've uh, talked about the advantages of one, two grow enough. <clears throat> Let's start planting. Okay, we've got three species. I'll run through each one at a time as we plant it. Let's start off with the Eleocaris mini. This is dwarf hair grass. It's a really small hair grass, barely gets to an inch tall. What we do, very, very simple way to prepare it. Peel off your lid. Remove your whole clump in one go. And you've got your magic liquid there. Don't drink it. Rinse that off now in the, in the water. And then I've got three pots of that. So I'll just repeat that process. Um, if you do get some of the nutrient-rich liquid in here, it's not, so, it's not a disaster. It's just it could potentially trigger algae because it's so rich in nutrients. So just give that a bit of a, a massage there. And then what I like to do is, <clears throat> there's a special way to prepare Eleocaris in the one, two, right? <clears throat> so it comes in like a solid kind of clump, you can see that. And all those roots are kind of matted together. So it can be quite tricky to kind of individually, what we need to do is individually kind of separate it into small portions, okay? So top tip, if you just kind of tear it gently, you can almost unravel it, hopefully. And then what we do is we, in, we separate individual, individual portions. So depending on how many pots you've got, depending on your budget, it can actually depend on how much you want to separate it. So, you know, if I had all day, I could plant the whole foreground there with just that one pot, you know, just by separating it into tiny individual portions we haven't got all day so i'll probably do about an inch or so two centimeters and then we just repeat that process all right who else who knows how to prepare one to grow anyone here yeah do you want to come up and give us a hand mate what's your name gary, gary. round of applause for gary everyone yeah. uh yeah do you want to just grab grab these out of here i'll show you yeah, and just pop them in there, mate, when you're done. So just repeat that process. It's worth taking your time to do this. You know, this is real crucial stage of aquascaping. You know, you want to buy the most healthy plants you can to start with. 
So have a chat with your shop owner, retailer, or the staff. Ask them how fresh are the plants. Try to get them as fresh as you can. And that's going to give you the best chance of success. You know, if you start off with a, a half dead plant, especially in a brand new setup, then you know you, you're on a you're in a real struggle, an uphill battle to start with. If those plants are really fresh, straight from the supplier, then they're really like healthy, they're ready to grow, they want to grow, and you're gonna have the absolutely the best chance of success. And then it's a really good idea to take your time to prepare them. You know, when I set up my first plant at aquarium, I didn't even realize that you had to take the plant out of its pot. <laughs> I just had this big plant in a pot and I just popped it in the tank. I didn't know any better. There wasn't like people like me to tell, you know, tell people what to do. So kind of learnt by trial and error, really. Oh, shameless plug as well while I'm here. There is a few copies of my book uh, available at the counter. Uh, is Joseph's here, isn't he? I've saved you a copy. Where is he? It's embarrassing, he's gone. Maybe he's got my book and gone already. Um, but yeah, there's going to be four copies if, if you want to buy a signed copy of my book. £30, I think, selling it for. But it's exclusive. There's no the last signed copies available in the world. So, but the book, if you're not if you've not got it or read it or heard about it, it's basically uh, a guide on how to aquascape. Everything you need to know, choosing the lighting, choosing filters, how to you know how to plant, what plants to use, algae. All done. Yeah. Nice. Do you want to start on another one? Do you want to do the Monte Carlo? Just leave one pot for me, though, so I'll talk about it. Thank you, mate. Okay. Sorry, was it Gary? Yeah, Gary. Thanks, Gary. Have I, have I met you before? No, no. Oh, okay. Got one of those faces. <laughs> yeah. What size is your tank at home? Which one? How many okay, have you got? Yeah, for me, planted, I've uh, got a three-cup planted, a uh, five-foot discus, and a four-foot mm. green. Nice. Have you got plants in the discus tank? A few Anubis, but not much yeah. else. I like to have the temperature above 27 yeah, degrees. Yeah, so yeah, and yeah. even the Anubis, I rotate it around. Yeah. When it looks unhealthy, I put it in the plant tank. Yeah. And switch it off. I tried to, I tried to plant a discus and it yeah, it's quite hard. Quite hard to do. Okay, that's the Elio Car is prepared. Gary's kindly gonna help prepare the, the Monte Carlo. I'll talk about that. I'll talk about all of the carpeting species first, and then I'm just gonna plant them because we're gonna be here a long time otherwise. This is uh, my Cranthamum Tweedii Monte Carlo, uh, another beautiful carpeting plant, a round leaf, relatively easy. Uh, doesn't need so much light, will definitely benefit from CO2 injection. You know, all aquarium plants will benefit from CO2. But same process as before. Give it a rinse and put that one there. Have you prepared Monte Carlo yeah, before? Yeah. yeah. Cool. I just chop it in half and then in half again and then angle. Do you want to do that? Yeah, that? Just watch Gary. I'm sure I do, yeah. No pressure, Gary. I'm going to follow you. It's because I, I, I struggle to do this. So you split it in half. Why well, don't you just keep dividing it in halves? Yeah. So half and then half again. And again, if you, if you had the patience and the time and, and you're on a tight budget, you could individually separate, there's literally thousands of little stems in here. You could actually individually separate those and plant them with tweezers. Uh, we haven't got time for that, but I've done that. I did a 60 centimeter layout about 10 years ago and I used one pot of the Monte Carlo and I did a, a rock layout like one of these and just used that one, one pot and uh, it was really great actually, it worked. So, you know, if you're on a tight budget, I think the pots are around six pounds each you can uh you can get really great value for money literally hundreds of individual plants here and this is like a for me this is part of the joy you know of aquascaping it's getting your hands on the plants you know really kind of looking at them appreciating them and then and then like getting excited because they're going to grow you know you're going to form a nice solid carpet along the front of the aquarium you know, something really rewarding, I think, about you know growing in a full carpet, so you eventually won't see any soil at all, and you get to witness that progression, that evolution, you know. Got one more. Do you want to? Yeah, if you carry on with yeah, that one, yeah, mate, that's sure. great. And then um, I'm just going to grab the Staragoni. <clears throat> Do 
Okay, next plant we've got is uh, Staragyne repens, or Staragyne repens, however you want to say the scientific name. Um, beautiful plant. It's gonna. It's not necessarily a carpeting plant. It's like a very kind of uh, dense bush-like stem plant. Although you can kind of carpet with it if you want to. Um, it's gonna. It grows taller than the Monte Carlo and the hair grass. So I'm going to plant that around the stones and it's going to act as a transition. So you'll have the relatively low carpet that's going to lead up to the taller Staragyne and then up to the hardscape. So you get this nice kind of gentle uh, leaning up of the plants. So same process as before. Peel off your lid. Give it a quick rinse. And then you can just separate it into your portions again. And just like before, if you're on a tight budget, you can separate it. You know, it's probably 100 or so stems there. If you had the time and patience, you can separate that individually. But you can buy this. Most of these plants will come in the one, two grow or the pot. But you get so many more plants here in the, in the one, two grow. They're just smaller. They're basically, they are baby plants. They're grown from tiny, tiny little plants in the laboratories. And then they, they've got these big growth rooms where literally hundreds of thousands of them are growing under like these high, you know, high, um, high efficiency LEDs. And, you know, in a few weeks, they're, you know, pop, almost popping out of there. You can see they're trying to break out of the, the pot there and then they're ready to go to you guys. It's a real cool process. I get, I'm very lucky I get to see the whole, the whole thing in Denmark. Some shops have um, special coolers, special fridges with these. Do you have fridges here? Yeah. So they've got literally like an upright fridge with a glass uh, you know, window door at the front. And they're actually LED lit as well, these fridges. So these plants are stored at about 15, 16 degrees Celsius. And that prolongs the life of the plant in that fridge. So, you know, they're very happy for a good few weeks at a time if they're stored like that. Can I do that one for us, mate? Cheers. Thanks, Gary. Where are you from? Uh, Bursco near Southport. Oh, yeah, I know Bursco, yeah. I know uh, Jeremy quite well. Do you? Yeah. Yeah, I'm lucky. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. I know. I know Jeremy very well. I knew him when he was um, BFK ed yeah. editor, before that even. He was Starfighter when I met him, BFK. Yeah, that was 2006. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, good advice. He's, yeah, he's, yeah. He's, he's, he's what he doesn't know about fish. Yeah, any type any type of fish keeping there, marine, freshwater. Indeed. He's ponds. Ponds, goldfish, fancy goldfish. Yeah, he's a bit of a legend. Hello, Jeremy, if you're watching. <laughs> yeah, I used to um, go, go to McDonald's with him and take the kids. Yeah, yeah. 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 Back in the day, I used to live in Peterborough. I used to live in Stanford. I used to live in Peterborough. Yeah. Um, okay, we'll do that. I'll, I'll do that one now, actually. This isn't a carpeting plant, but I'm going to prepare it now because it is the one to grow. So this is a Cryptogorony undulatus broadleaf. At the moment, it's only that tall, but it can grow. I've got it growing in my Oase Highline 400, my 400 litre tank at home, and it's kind of this tall at the moment. Um, I've never seen it actually grow that tall before, so I'm quite impressed. So this is like a mid-ground plant. We're not going to plant this around the foreground. This is mid-ground. We do have a smaller crypt for later to go in front of this, although, ironically, that's a potted plant, so at the moment, it's taller. But because this will grow taller eventually, it's going to go behind. Does that make sense? It makes sense, doesn't it? It did to me. Uh, uh, good question. Trimming. Yeah, you just trim, basically. That's why we have we use sharp scissors. And if it's going too big, you could just trim a whole leaf off. Trim the leaf right off by the base if you can. Otherwise, the if you trim the leaf off too high, then that bottom stem part rots away. So actually with, with Crips or Amazon Swords Echinodorus, what I like to do is actually get my hand right to the bottom of a leaf and tear it away like a sharp tug from the rootstock and just remove that leaf. 
other plants like stem plants you can just trim like you would a bush at home and it, it kind of regrows um yeah but there are lots of different kind of ways to maintain the plants that's kind of a workshop in itself really yeah yeah you could do that as well and then replant yeah yeah perfect yeah and then you could propagate it that way uh do you want to do yeah yeah thanks mate so uh cryptogorny undulatus broadleaf going to put this towards the mid ground same way as before take the whole lump out now this is a bit more you have to be a bit kind of more brutal with this the the roots really are kind of entwined with each other. So you kind of have to find a natural separation space and then just gently kind of tease it apart, hopefully without destroying it too much. And then you could probably get five or six individual portions out of that, but each portion is probably going to have three or four individual plants there. Is that okay? Mm. Yeah. So this is a, it's a beautiful plant. At the moment, it's kind of a green uh, brown. And that actually, what it does look like that. But under good lighting, you can, it does actually have a reddy tinge to it, which is really beautiful, especially in stronger lighting. You normally find if you've got, um, the stronger the light, the more potential your plant has to go red, basically. Red plants are very popular. You know, it's obviously a nice impact but they tend to be a little bit more demanding, especially for light. A red plant doesn't, it's not green, obviously, it's red. So it doesn't, uh, it doesn't have so much chlorophyll in it. So the green part of the plant is the chlorophyll, which is what's responsible for it photosynthesizing. So if it doesn't have an, a lot of green, it tends to need more light to grow. Hopefully that makes sense. Now, carpeting plants, they tend to be a little bit more demanding as well. And it's not necessarily Sorry. the plant, no worries, not necessarily the, the, the plant itself. It's where it's situated in the aquarium. So carpeting plants, much lower down in the aquarium, so further away from the light. So it's why a lot of carpeting plants tend to need a little bit more light because they're not so near, near the light. Also, um, really good idea to use CO2 injection with most carpeting plants. And what you can happen is the CO2, you can struggle to get right down in the uh, bottom of the aquarium. So this is why I like to promote good levels of circulation, you know, like five to ten times the tank's volume per hour. Okay, I think we're ready to start planting. Yeah. Um, thanks, mate. Sorry. Thank you. Cheers, Gary, everyone. Okay, now important to keep them wet all right start planting <clears throat> what you can do is actually wet the soil if you want to what i definitely don't do is fill up with water first and then plant it's just a mess so i like to plant into dry soil some aquascapers will spray the soil get it wet first but actually i find if you plant into dry soil the, the plant actually grips better and then when you do fill up with water, there's less chance of the plants floating, okay? Okay, let's start off with the Eleocaris, the Secularis mini. This is the dwarf hair grass. So what I'm going to do is mix up almost randomly the hair grass and the Monte Carlo. And then what that does, it creates a nice natural kind of blend. If I just did like a solid line of the hair grass and a solid line of the Monte Carlo, it's just not going to look very natural. What we're trying to do is like mimic nature. So when you look outside at a kind of a meadow or you know some sort of natural like landscape, you, you, you very rarely find a monoculture. You very rarely find one species just all the way through, unless you're looking at crop fields, which aren't natural, obviously. Okay, so what I like to do is just grab your hair grass and your tweezers and then just pop it in. And then hopefully it stays in there. And then just repeat that process. Um, there's no real kind of rule, but as long as it's anchored, so you don't be afraid to push it in quite far. 
as long as those roots are kind of in contact with the soil and there's some of the plant exposed, then that's fine. A good idea to put them in quite deep at the beginning. Um, it's going to be less chance of them floating away when the water is added. Um, have we got another member? Have we got any chance of some more tweezers? Excuse me, member of staff. Yeah, and then uh, Gary can give us a. And then anyone else wants to have a go? Cheers, mate. Yeah, it does. Um, yeah, you can just keep trimming it and trimming it, and obviously it does eventually come too, ten too dense. And then the the best answer really is to unfortunately uproot it all, and it'll come off at a solid carpet in one go, and then chop it up into your portions, like your man said here, and then plant the healthiest bits and start over again. That's the best bet, yeah. But um, it, it can... They, I mean, I've had a carpet going for over a year probably before I had to do that. But just the real top tip is to um, to avoid an excess of uh, detritus, you know, waste organics building up in the carpet because then you'll start to get uh, die off and algae and stuff. So I just like to wave my hand just above the hair grass carpet during the water change and then all that stuff that comes up, you can siphon away. Um, and depending on how dense the carpet is, you can even get your hose and almost push it into the carpet and suck up all of that waste stuff. Obviously, in a mature carpet, yeah. And most carpets are, aren't 100% life. You know, you're going to have to do some heavy maintenance at some point. Um, yeah, I'm thinking of like the one that would last the longest. Probably the slowest growing, like a Marsalea carpet, would probably be the lowest maintenance, I'd say. But yeah, if you do want to grow, I mean, carpeting plants are really popular. You know, it's lovely to see that full, you know, substrate covered with your plants. But you will more than likely need good good lighting. Ah, oh, cheers, mate. Anyone else want to go out planting? <coughs> no? Gary? Cheers, mate. Round of applause for Gary again. Hey. Yeah. Do um, you want to do the Monte Carlo? Yeah. In fact, what I'll do, I'll give you another... I'll give you one of these and then we can. So Gary's going to plant the Monte Carlo, which is good because I don't really like planting it. <laughs> the other way around, I don't like the hergrass. Oh, there you go then. Perfect team. Teamwork. And if, yeah, if you just pop it in sort of randomly in between the hair grass. And what will happen is those the, the hair grass is going to carpet. What happens is it sends out runners in the soil, under the soil, which you don't really see. You might see it at the front of the glass there and then new leaves come up and it just keeps repeating that process and eventually gets real dense kind of lawn thing. And it will be a similar thing with the uh, Monte Carlo. And then they're just going to kind of blend into each other and look really natural. So we like to plant densely, you know, especially in a new setup. If we, if you don't plant, I, I thought of an analogy yesterday. I was in the garden with my wife. Um, beautiful day, had a beer, sat outside, and I was thinking about the workshop. I was getting really excited about today, and I said to my wife, I said, "Algae is like if you've got a bare patch of land, like just soil, and no plants in there." What's going to happen? It's going to get covered in weeds, isn't it? Well, algae are like weeds, right? So if you just had the soil in here and you put the light on, no other plants, you're just going to get algae growth, nothing else, right? So what I'm saying is the more plants you have, the less chance of algae you get because what happens is the plants will grow and the more plants you have and the faster those plants are growing, the less chance of algae you have because the plants are using all of the available resources rather than the algae. So a really good idea to plant as heavily as you can, as densely as you can from the outset, as many plants as you can kind of afford, or as many plants as you can fit in there. Try to make a proportion of those plants fast growing 
because the faster the plant's growing, the less opportunity is for algae growth. You know, and algae is the you know enemy really of, of most uh, most aquarium keepers or nuisance algae. And the thing is, with a planted aquarium, you're normally dealing with more light, more nutrients, and these are the things that algae love. Okay, so to combat that, we need more plants. No, no, I've never used it ever. Actually, it's, I think UV is more appropriate for single cell algae like green water, and good for you know pest, you know kind of disease control and things like that. I'm not dissing UV, um, but I've never never used it. Um, yeah, never felt the need to use it. Yeah, hello. And yeah, sure. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, a real easy way is to use floating plants. You've got you've got those already. Stem plants. Most a lot of stem plants are fast growers. So Limnophila sessiflora, uh, Ambulia is the common name. Uh, quite beautiful. Really, really fast growers. We use it. Yeah, it's got like um, need, like real needle-like leaves, really, really fast. Can grow like a couple of inches a day in, in really high light and CO2. We actually use that a lot at Tropica when we're doing new setups. We'll put literally a potted version of it and we'll keep them in their pots and we just pop them in, just put like 10 or so pots in there in the background. Uh, and then after a week or so, just take the whole, once, it, once the tank's grown in, just take them all out. And it just helps to avoid that early algae stage Algae is really uh, common in new setups because the balance isn't there. The plants aren't kind of growing to their potential yet. So they haven't got that ability to use the resources. But algae is like super adaptable, you know, and will quite happily use those resources. So the startup phase is the most important, really, to kind of get a grip of your thing, you know, get, get into that maintenance kind of practice. You know, you want to be doing really big kind of frequent water changes in the early stages, in the first few weeks, that's going to really help limit the risk of algae. Other species I'd recommend, like a lot of the rotalas, the easy rotalas uh, are good. Uh, Hygrophila, polysperma. Um, what have we got today? Got some Hygrophila today, actually, we'll talk about that later. Yeah, um, basically any fast-growing stem plant. If you go on the Tropica website, um, tropica.com, and they have an app uh, an app now available, which is free. You can download Tropica. It's not tropical without the L on the end. Uh, iOS and Android devices. It will have a complete list of all the plant species, plant profiles, and every, every plant has a... Um, a link to an inspirational layout where they've used that plant. So you can really see how that plant, plant's developed and used in a real world situation. Looking good, mate. So this process is, um, I find it really relaxing, really therapeutic. Not quite so much when you sit on stage in front of a load of people. But when I'm at home, you know, I'll have some chill out music on or listen to a podcast or an audio book and just like really enjoy it. You know, take your time preparing the plants, get yourself some nice aquascaping tools and just, just relax, enjoy it. You know, when you can, I kind of like get excited because I know how it's going to grow. I can visualize how it's going to look in like a couple of months time. And even as a complete beginner, um, you might you might fail, you know, and I would always look at failure as opportunity to learn. Don't you know? Try not to be put off by mistakes. You know, mistakes are really important in order to really learn and grow. So, if you do fail, and if your plant does melt or doesn't grow very well, you know, look at the reason why. You know, have you got enough light? Have you got CO two? Was the plant healthy to begin with when you bought it? Do you have a, did you have enough plants in there? You know, a lot of people will, you know, spend a lot of money on a system like this, and then they'll try to save some money by just buying a few plants and thinking they can grow the plants and propagate them. But it's really, like I said earlier, 
you know, analogy about an open soil garden, you know, really fill it up with plants to start with if you can. And you have much better chance of success. You know, a lot of people have the mindset, oh, I just don't have much luck with plants. You know, I just, I'm just no good with plants. Well, everyone has the potential to be great with plants. You just need to have the right kit, you know, the right equipment, the right techniques, a bit of patience, you know, a willingness to learn, a willingness to make mistakes and learn from them, you know. And I think that's one of the reasons, you know, aquascaping and planted aquariums are, are really great because there's no, they're a natural system and they, you know, the plants don't read the books. So some people will succeed with, you know, maybe an advanced plant in a low tech setup. You know, some people might fail with an easy plant in, in an advanced setup, you know, but they're just, like I say, these things are there for you to learn from. You know, if you, if you had a, if you struggled with a certain species over and over again, you know, maybe that species isn't for you. There's another 150 or so out there to try. You know, don't be, try not to be despondent if you do struggle at the start. Yeah. Yeah. Good. There you go. I'm, I'm, the, I'm not, you know, yeah, that's great. And that's why I do what I do. You know, I think it's such a beautiful hobby and it's so relaxing, you know, to sit at home and look at your aquascape and just even maintaining it, I find really not really like a, a lovely process. A lot of people are put off by the maintenance, but if you can learn to love the maintenance, then I'd argue that's probably one of the keys to success. You know, dedicate a certain amount of time you know, every week, you know, for you and the aquarium, that's like your special time. And just, you know, almost make it a non-negotiable thing, you know, put it in your, in your weekly diary, your weekly schedule, and make it uh, almost like a routine, you know, make it the same day every week, or make, maybe the same time every week if you can. And it becomes a habit. Once it's a habit, then it's just really easy to do. And then just learn to love it. You know, water changes. Most people, like, get bored of water changes. I love it. You know, I just like, you just know what, I love it, but not because of the watching the water go down and up again. And all. I just love to know that I am refreshing that whole system, you know, because those fish, the shrimp, the snails, the bacteria, the plants themselves, they're all living entities. They're all producing waste in a closed system. And the only way for you to really refresh that system is by doing a water change. Um, there are low-tech methods out there and there are no water change kind of tanks out there. And that's fine. I've got nothing against those. But in my mind, I just feel like by changing the water, I, I, I can see the fish are more active. You know, I can see the plants are a little bit more vibrant, especially the day after. The water is more, you know, the clarity of the water is normally better. And uh, yeah, yeah, a water change. It's just like, uh, yeah, I think it's really therapeutic. You know, on water changes, do the water, if you're doing a maintenance practice, so trimming the plant, if, you, if you're kind of maintaining the substrate, so you wouldn't, like a regular gravel tank, you wouldn't gravel vacuum this, obviously, because it's soil. But what I would do, especially once the plants are rooted better, is during the water change practice, just wave your hand, like just above the plants. If the plants are tall, you know, get your hand in there, give them a good stroke, you know, a good touch, and all that detritus, all that waste organics is going to be lifted into the water column. And then we do the, you do the water change right at the end, and then you're getting rid of all that rubbish, all that crap, putting fresh water in there, and then that's really going to, you know, limit the chance of algae. You know, if we have too much waste organics, detritus building up on the plants, on the hardscape, in the carpet, you know, that's going to trigger algae so we need to limit that and that's why we do the do the water changes but not just the water change you know actually get your hand in there and uh have a play and you'll see it's quite surprising how much dirt can come off the stuff the plants and the hardscape you know plants themselves they're, they're living aren't they they're, they're, they're growing and part of that is they're actually producing waste 
they're producing waste organics. So, you know, you have to think about that. And that's why we do the water changes. It's basically to limit that, those waste organics. Yeah, I do, yeah. Um, yeah, I use a liquid, yeah, I use um, uh, Fritz Aquatics, it's a US brand, um, really concentrated, it's a little bit like Seachem Prime. And yeah, 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 and I actually do it, uh, so I actually pump my tap water in, either from the garden direct, or from my kitchen sink, depending on time of year, and then I just add the dechlorinator as it's getting pumped in, yeah. Fritz Aquatics, yeah. I don't know if they stock it here, but Seachem is another brand that's pretty good. I know they sponsor, they're sponsoring some of this stuff. Seachem Prime, very popular. Yeah, yeah. But it's uh, they're all kind of similar. And I, yeah, I, I don't, I don't have much chlorine in my tap water at home. I've got it tested, um, but I do use, I do use it just in case. And I do big water changes. I do at least fifty percent water change every time. In my home aquascapes, I change at least 50% every week. Do you worry about temperature? I don't actually worry so much. What about shrimp? Like no. Just straight in with the 19, 20 degrees water. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, usually, yeah. yeah. A couple of degrees or so is normally okay. And because um, cause the water's going in kind of slowly, yeah, the temperature adjusts a little bit. You wouldn't want to like flood it with cold water straight away. See, I've been using a pond dechlorinator. Yeah, yeah, so, so it's more concentrated. Doing the, the liquid all the time, yeah. just straight for a pond dechlorinator. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Okay, I'm just going to yeah, leave some. More? No, yeah. yeah, keep going. I'm going to plant the Staragyne so I don't run out of space. So we talked about the Staragyne reapens as a transitional plant. So I'm going to plant that now around the base of the stones. That's all right, mate. So. Push it in nice and firmly. Sometimes when you try to take the tweezers out, the plant wants to come out at the same time, like that. So what you do is just put your finger on top and then withdraw, and there we go. I'm using, all together, I'm using uh, 12. So three pots of the hair grass, three of the Monte Carlo, three of the crypts, and Three of the, yeah, so 16 altogether I've got here of a Staragyne. Um, you could get away with less at home because you could take more time to separate them more. But I want to get kind of like a big impact here today. And that's why I'm probably using, you know, maybe more than is absolutely necessary. Have you used those small pots the ones in the Yeah, you, ideally, yeah, the one two grows. I'm not today, I'm using big potted ones, which I'll show you later because I want to get an instant impact. But if I was at home, I would use all one to grow because um, of the advantages I said earlier. You know, more quantity, guaranteed to be free from algae, et cetera. And they're, they're, they're going to grow. This is going to, I can guarantee you in three days, you'll see significant growth in these already, especially you've got good lighting here, good full spectrum lighting. Will you be using CO2 injection? You know, once you use CO2 injection, it, you know, you really start to see huge benefits in plant growth. You know, you're looking at five to ten times the speed of the plant growth. And you'll just have so much more chance of success, especially with more delicate species. You think about the vast majority of aquarium plants in nature, they grow out of water. So it's only in the wet season. So, you know, most of the year it's growing out of water. Then you get the rainy season and then the plant's flooded and it has to grow underwater. And a lot of the times they'll really struggle in nature to go underwater. So we're kind of cheating a bit in our aquariums. We're injecting CO2, which almost fools the plant into thinking it's growing out of water again because that high CO2 level. Um, it's why a lot of plants, well not a lot, but some plants will actually flower underwater. I mean, that, that this doesn't have any benefit. It can't reproduce that way in nature, but it thinks it's underwater, it thinks it's out of water because I, I would argue because of the uh, high CO2 level. But yeah, Buca philandra, Anubius, these all flower quite regularly underwater. It's quite pretty to see, but it doesn't actually serve any purpose. You can't actually reproduce the plant that way. Hello. Hello, I just wonder what soil allergens you would recommend. Because it's, you know, like when you use like bacteria or something, but I don't know if that's helpful or not. I just kind of don't want to see them on Yeah, um, 
good question. It's it's uh it's almost like a dark art, you know, like the ADA substrate system. You know, you've got uh, power sand, factor 100, tourmaline BC, all of these things. Um, you don't need you don't need them to have success. You know, th this is fine without any of those, but you you could potentially get a bit an easier startup, and they're potentially more nutrients in the long term. Uh, but it's very expensive, as you probably know. So um, if you've got the money, the funds, and you want to buy into that whole system, then that's okay. That's the ADA system you're talking about. But the, the ADA system is designed for you to use all of their products for the whole thing. So the whole substrate system, the fertilizer system, they're kind of designed to be used together. And it's very expensive, but very user-friendly because it's just like, do what we say and you're guaranteed to get good results. Yeah, what, what are you using soil as well? Yeah. Which what uh, aqua soil? ADA or um if you've got it, I'd use it, definitely. Yeah, but you don't need it. You can just use the Amazonia aqua soil on its own as well. Oh the stratum? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean if you've got it, then it's not definitely not gonna do any harm. And if you bought it already, have you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh you yeah, yeah. It's not definitely not going to do any harm, but um, I would, especially for beginners, I would just stick to just stick to using a soil on its own, and then a decent quality liquid fertilizer, and then that's all you need. Yeah, um, I use I've used loads of different fer liquid fertilizers. Uh, I like to use an all-in-one product, you know, a bottle that contains everything in one go, just to make it easy. Um, Tropica Specialized Nutrition, I don't know if we've got any around, is a good one. Uh, Awaze have one now, or a couple, on um, their Scaper Line series, which I'm using at home, uh, which is getting great results with. But it's, it's really, you really kind of spoiled these days for so many great products out there. Seachem do a lot of liquid fertilizer range. They tend to have um, lots of different bottles for different nutrients. So you can really tailor, you know, your... If you're a bit more advanced and you want to test for different like nutrient levels and stuff, you can do that. But yeah, I mean, it, it's almost um, can be a little bit confusing because there are so many great products out there now to, to achieve success. You can always just read my book though, and simplify it or watch my workshops. I also have a YouTube channel with lots of kind of instructional videos on as well. 800 videos on there now. No. Do you mean to like bulk it out? Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, if you want to like create real steep substrate and you don't want to use like 18 bags of soil yeah you can just like use crushed lava rock pumice stone or any like inert material in a net bag and then yeah put that on the base of your aquarium and then put your soil on top you're basically yeah bulking it out as long as like the top couple of inches is soil for your plants to anchor into um jbl have a product called volcano mineral i think which is like uh basically a crushed lava stone i think doesn't actually add any kind of real nutrients or anything, but it's uh, like an, yeah, it just bulks it out. Yeah, it's no problem. Yeah. Okay. Um, most plants are fine from around 14, 15 up to say 28, but what, what, probably what was happening is it was used to that temperature, so it adapted to that and then by putting it in suddenly something that was potentially 10 degrees cooler or however cooler it was, that may be why it struggled. Yeah, well, the same in, the, in the tropical. tropical and it did better in the cold. Yeah, because like in the tropical it wasn't growing, it was melting back, it was... Yeah. Okay. And it's thriving, it's growing, it's green, it's green. That's interesting, isn't it? Yeah, I didn't know whether it was 
Are you, is there a difference in the lighting? Uh, yeah, so um, the Tropicana A Tower um, light bulb is um, kind of like a red. Yeah, they're like a bit more subdued. Um, well, maybe kind of paradoxically, the the, uh, the less intense light might have helped it. So if you weren't, if you had more light in your tropical, in combination with more temperature, and are we using CO two injection in the tropical? No. Yeah. The cold. Yeah. Yeah. It, it'll be. Yeah. It's probably to do with like the plant metabolism. So, um, all living things are like direct. The, the all living things grow or me me metabolize in proportion to temperature. So, in your tropical, the temperature is warmer. So the plant actually wants to grow quicker. But if it's not supported with uh, appropriate light or CO2 or fertilizers, then it's really going to struggle. So when you put it in a cold water tank, the, the, it would want to grow much more slowly because it's much cooler. So actually that lower level of lighting or the, diff the different lighting and the fact that you had no CO2 is probably more compatible with it. And that's maybe why it did better. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, because I mean, we, we were locked up. Here. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm just hypothesizing. I'm, it's not a guaranteed truth yeah okay <laughs> but yeah i mean um another thing about cooler water is it actually has a higher oxygen content and oxygen is actually a nutrient for plants believe it or not as well so that could be another reason and maybe they just love the axolotl poo as well yeah what did you what do you feed the axolotls um, uh, yeah um, uh, so there's probably a lot more nutrients from those for the Oh, okay, so you keep it really. Yeah. But I guess even so, the axolotls, do they produce a lot of waste themselves? Yeah, so maybe that was contributing to the nutrients for the plants. So, uh, Java fern or Microsorum is, is quite nu nitrogen hungry. It likes to have a lot of nitrogen. So, if it's having more nitrogen from your axolotl waste, then that might be helpful as well. Thanks, Gary. I don't have time. No rushes there. I'm enjoying myself up here. I know. It's really beautiful and sunny down south. And then drove up the M6. It's really got darker and darker, wetter and wetter. Yeah. You guys are much more friendly than southerners, though. Yeah. <laughs> Sound a bit aggressive. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, apart from that guy, he wants to fight every seven. <laughs> Who's come? Anyone come from far away? No, all local, all northern. Using RO water, yeah, I used I used to run RO in, in uh, about ten years ago, just for a year or so. Yeah, Pain in the arse. And then, yeah. well, I did it, and then I started doing fifty percent, and then forty percent, and now I don't bother. Yeah. And I haven't really got. I don't think you have soft water up here, don't you? I don't where I am. It's extremely hard. Oh, is it? Yeah. In yeah. Oh, it is, is it? Interesting. Um, most plants prefer. It's a good point, actually. Good learning point. Most plants do better in softer water. They have more access to CO2. Uh, nutrients seem to be more accessible as well. So you can get away with running like less fertilizer and less CO2 in a soft water setup. If I have very hard water where I live, it's about TDS of about 350. Um, so I go through a lot of CO2 in comparison. So is that why I'm having to put a lot more CO2 into my tank? I'm running two CO2. Yeah. Five, six, yeah. And I barely ever get towards the yellow mark. Yeah. Yeah, that'll be why. Because your water's hard. Yeah. Um, got a bit more hair grass to do. Let's go as dense as we can. <clears throat> Is it this 
from the ECPDF is a requirement to have good ideas in support of these issues? Uh, if, if, if I could like magically have on tap any kind of TDS or any water chemistry, I would go for. Now, I don't normally promote this sort of thing because I think everyone should just grow stuff in what they have. But if I had a, if I had the option, I'd probably go for a TDS of around 100, 150, a KH of around two, GH of about six, something like that. That's sort of really suitable for for most plants. But you know, it's really interesting. Some plants will actually really do better in harder water. So Vallis naria, for instance, it, it actually likes to use a lot of its carbon source from bicarbonates in the water, which is harder water. But in my mind, you know, my especially for beginners, try to uh, and you know, same goes with uh, when you're choosing your fish. Is is keep what you keep what you can grow or have access to easily. So figure out what your tap water is and then go from there. You can go down the RO route, but it's a lot more complex, a lot more expensive, there's a lot more waste as well. Um, you know, we're not running like SPS sort of reef tanks where you really need to be focused on the water chemistry. You know, freshwater plants, plants in nature are very adaptable. You know, most of them are actually aquatic weeds in nature. So that, you know, by that nature, they're just gonna adapt to almost any conditions. So, you know, don't yeah, try not to be super focused too much on water chemistry, unless you like breeding you know, special shrimp. Um, I mean, cherry shrimp will, will breed in most water. You know, if you want to keep bee shrimp, like Caridina species, they tend to like it a bit more, a bit softer. Uh, but even then, I mean, uh, I know a guy who's breeding uh, crystal reds in, in my very hard tap water. So if you're using soil, this gives you a lot more chance of success. You know, the soil brings down that hardness a touch, promotes uh, obviously healthy root growth, healthy plants. Um, and the soil is actually really good for shrimp because it's got a really high surface area. If you magnify a grain of soil, it's actually like a very porous structure. So there's a lot of surface area there for bacteria colonization, microorganisms, which the shrimp will just love to kind of graze on. Okay, we're nearly done with the foreground. I think that'll do for now. Maybe touch it up a bit later. Let's move on to uh, mid-ground. I can't remember what we got. Let's have a look. <clears throat> oh, okay. Briny. Ah, yeah, nice. <clears throat> Okay, we're going on to some regular potted plants now. These are grown in the greenhouses at Tropica. And as you can see, super healthy root growth. Uh, this is Cryptocorone albida brown. It's a relatively small crypt, but has this beautiful uh, brown leaves, as you can see. And actually under high lighting, and you look really closely at the plants, it actually has like really distinct red and green patterning. Really quite beautiful. I do love crypts. There's so many different species available. I think Tropica do 10, 10, 12 different types, ranging in size from, you know, Crip Parva, which will kind of get this tall, all the way to the Crispatula or the Eusteriana, which will grow, you know, if you let it go that big. So to prepare our pot, really easy. Two halves of rock wool, just separate them, really easy. You might have noticed I just sort of ripped the bottom of the roots off and I had to do that to take the pot out because they're, the, the root growth is so healthy, it's kind of impossible to take it out of the pot otherwise. And then what you can do is if you're fancy, you can use scissors or you can just rip it with your fingers. Just be fancy today. Um, just trim to about sort of two centimeters, an inch or so. What that does is just makes planting much easier makes it easier to kind of prepare as well. Split that into different portions now. And then plant as before with your tweezers. So I'll just prepare all of those. How many have we got? Four, four pots. Where's Gary? Yeah. So the interesting thing about Crips is um, you, a lot, maybe some of you may have heard of crit melt. So this is a, 
basically when the plant's adapting from its underwater, uh, from its out of water growth. So this is grown out of water hydroponically in the greenhouses, like we chatted about earlier. Um, when you put it in the aquarium, it has to adapt to its underwater growth, of course. And then during that process, it can actually it can actually really struggle, and you'll find some of the leaves will melt. Um, but the good news is, if it's a healthy plant to start with, the uh, the plant will just grow new leaves. So remove that old rotten leaf. And then what will happen is the plant will produce new leaves. Those new leaves will be readily adapted to the underwater form. And then you'll achieve, yeah, you'll just see the plant grow quite nicely. So what, the, some, what the, some of the pros do, the proscapers, they'll actually trim that off and do it now, in fact. It breaks my heart, but they do this. And they just plant the rootstock there. And then that will produce new leaves, which have already uh, adapted to underwater growth. I'm not going to do it with the others because I like to see the plant, you know, especially in a workshop. But yeah, that's what some of the pros do. And then you won't, you're guaranteed not to get any of that melting. It just looks, you know, doesn't look like anything, obviously. No, I haven't. No. Maybe I should. Yeah. Experiment. So I'm going to pop this all the way to the left. And then the, the guys at Fire the Aquatics can see how it compares. And I'll put one next to it. See what happens. So what, what can happen after some time? Some of the nutrient content of the soil will slowly get lower and lower as the plants use it. Uh, what you can do is boost the root growth by using like uh, root capsules. So there's different brands out there. Tropica do uh, nutrition capsules. A while as they do some, I think it's JBL, Denelay, loads of different brands do them. And uh, these are just like, sometimes they're gelatin capsules, sometimes they're actually like a solid form. But just insert those with your tweezers around the plant that you want to kind of boost the growth of. And uh, away you go. If you have a, an aquarium at home and you don't have a soil substrate, and you just want to kind of give those plants a bit of a boost, especially if they're kind of heavy root feeders like uh, Crips or Amazon Swords. You can use these root capsules and then they'll really, you know, give those plants a bit of a, a nice boost. <clears throat> I think I might go, I might do hair grass all the way back actually. What else have we got? Nymphophila, Hygrophila, Nubius. Oh, we actually might do the. Um... No, I'll tell you what, I'll do the Eustriana. Not the Eustriana. I'm just talking to myself. People at home can probably hear me. Hello. <laughs> so, the good thing about Crips is that they're shade tolerant as well. They do really well in shaded areas. So, I can put that in there, no problem. Any more questions? I'm going to get in my um, meditative zone in a minute. I'm just going to start zoning out and planting. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's quite a controversial one, that. Some, some of the brands are like basically diluted glutahaldehyde, which is toxic to all life forms. So I, try, I don't usually recommend it. Um, there are some other brands out there which claim not to be glutahaldehyde, but I, I've never actually much experience with them at all. I've, I don't use it. I haven't used it for years. Um, I, I guess it's worth a try. I'll just say that. Uh, but just be really careful when you're handling it. Don't breathe in the vapor. Don't touch it. If it is the goose how dry stuff, it's really nasty business. Now uh, you can smell it. You can normally smell it. It smells like a bleach, basically. <coughs> they should do. Uh, yeah. 
Well, yeah, yeah. I know, I know Seacam have Seacam Flourish XL, um, which they say isn't glued to how dried, but it, I think it's like a, a very similar compound, and it's, it smells like it, and it will it kills algae very well. So it's of, 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 often marketed as an anti-algae product, although in the UK there's strict kind of regulation on algae sides. So they, you know, it's all a bit complicated. Basically, um, the best way to definitely get more carbon is to use CO2 injection. That's that's the only okay. Nothing to be afraid of. It's just quite it's quite expensive if you want to buy a good quality kit. That's one of the big downsides to it. Yeah, well, you have to get over that, won't you, if you want to use it. That's why my job is not happening. What about some cheaper options? People have like a two-liter bottle and they literally pop like carbon. Yeah, the use-based system. Yeah, DIY. Yeah, that's a good point, Gary. Yeah. So you can go DIY CO2 with sugar, yeast, water. And yeah, I've had quite good results with it. But it, you tend to get a much, there's no control yeah. over the level. And then you'll get like an initial surge for a few days and then it will die down. So, you, you know, plants actually really love consistency yeah. with CO2. And I often find you that that can trigger algae. If you if your CO2 fluctuates too much, wow. then yeah. So if you did go to the CO2 uh, DOI route, then... Um, you could use multiple, like two systems, and then set them up at different times and change the mixtures alternately, yeah. and then you get more of a consistent. Wow. Yeah. Uh, Tropica do a, a um, like a, they call, I think they call it bio CO2. It's like a similar thing, similar principle. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you've got anything over sort of 50, 30, 60 liters, <laughs> and yeah, you really need to go pressurized, yeah. you know, to get the benefits. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, last few Albeda Browns. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I use, uh, at the moment, I'm using Oase Scaper Line. They've got, they do a daily one. Hello, mate. They do a daily one and a weekly one, uh, which I'm having good results with. Um, in my experience, plants tend to, especially in a high energy tank with like good light and CO2, plants tend to do better with like a daily fertilizer, so a little bit every day rather than a big load of fertilizer once a week. Um, but always better to add a little bit always go for more generous with fertilizers especially in a heavily planted tank it's much better for the plant to have almost too much food than not enough if the, if you kind of don't have enough fertilizer the plant can get unhealthy start to like get yellowing leaves that leaves the door open for algae so people are often scared to put too more fertilizer in because it they think it causes algae but it's actually the other way around if you don't put enough in that will more likely cause algae Yeah, exactly. Yeah, big water change. Yeah, we call that as the old estimative index method. So you deliberately kind of overdose a little bit every day, and then once a week do like a fifty percent water change, and then that just resets all the levels. Yeah. Okay, we are. That's going to go. And then the Willis CI in the middle. Yeah, that'd be nice. Okay. Got another crypt here. This is Cryptocryne Willis CI. This is actually um, as tall as it will get, actually. It won't get any taller than this. But the leaf shape will change as it adapts to underwater growth. It'll actually get a lot more elongated, like a sword, rather than like a bulbous end there. So exactly the same way as before. Harry? Cheers, mate. So divide the two halves of rock wool. This is basically like fiberglass, like you know, like roof insulation. 
basically like that, uh, impregnated with loads of nutrients in the, in the hydroponic tables in the nursery. And then that's obviously where the plant gets all its food from. You can see the roots embedded. So the, the plants were actually inserted in, in this as tiny little babies in the plastic pot. And then they go onto big growth tables and then eventually probably eight weeks or so, and then it'll be that big, ready for, ready for us. Now what you can experience is the, uh, <coughs> the wool actually gets a little bit kind of um, hard to remove. So if you do it under water, it's a little bit easier. It doesn't actually matter if you get a little bit of this stuff, the, the rock wool in, in the tank is, is harmless and it's going to be buried in the soil anyway. And then separate that again. Nice and easy. So there is a risk, like I say, of it melting. The leaves, as the plant tries to adapt to underwater growth, I say it's been grown out of water hydroponically. But hopefully, you know, especially if you're using CO2 injection, the transition's a lot easier for the plant. Um, I'm, I'm lucky I get access to sort of three or six kilo bottles where I live. So I'll go for at least a three kilo would be fine. Six kilos are massive, so it might not fit in the cabinet. And um, you're probably running about four bubbles a second in here with a solenoid. Uh, so you're probably looking at six months or so. Yeah. Yeah, you've got a gate, you've got a... There's two dials usually. One's like the contents pressure and the other one's the working pressure. And what, what, what happens is usually it, on a full bottle, it's normally between 50 and 60 bar or about 800 to 1,000 PSI. And then what happens is it stays almost, it looks like it's full for ages. Then once it starts to go down, it goes down really quickly. So as soon as it starts to go down, you know you, in the next kind of week or so, you're probably going to have to change the bottle. And it's always a good idea to have a spare bottle if you can and then switch it over so you don't, the, the plants always have that CO2 available. If you go more than a few days without CO2 and, and those plants are used to the CO2 and you're going to really struggle, you'll probably get an algae bloom and the plants are really going to suffer. Pl plants get used to a certain level of CO2, you see. So if you are using CO2 injection, you know, try to keep it stable as much as possible. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you can do. You, you, you can all, always better to go non-CO2 to CO2 rather than the other way around. Um, depending on the plant species, if you've got really easy plants like Java fern, Anubias, Crips, you know, you could kind of wean the plants off CO2, but I wouldn't go suddenly full CO2 to no CO2 because that, that sort of change is going to shock the plant a bit and probably they're going to really suffer. It would be like um, you eat, eating steak and chips every day and then suddenly just eating like a small bowl of rice. <laughs> you know, you're going to be really... If the bottle ran out and you were on holiday, yeah. what would happen? Um, and you've still got your lights on and everything. You're probably going to... Well, it depends how long you're away on holiday for. But your, your plants are probably just going to like really slow down in growth. And then depending on your lighting level, if you've got like high lighting, then you're probably going to run into algae issues quite soon after. Yeah. No safety with having the CO2 off, no. What I would do, if, but first things first, you know, just make sure you've got enough in the bottle. You, you can see that usually. Um, but what I've done before is actually have the lights and CO2 off for up to a week. 
in a, in a mature, healthy planted aquarium, you can turn everything off for a week or so. Yeah, no problem. And actually, uh, they almost the plant almost goes into uh, plant it almost goes into a hibernation thing. And then when you do put the lights and the CO two on, it, they look all they look like you know they don't look great. But they're not dying, but in a few days they really come to life. It's like they've had a rest. Yeah. Oh yeah, I mean if the plant if if your tank's mature enough, um, and you if you've got an optimized system, you've got good light CO two fertilizers when you get home, then yeah, yeah, I'd recommend it. <laughs> it's probably you know I am always a bit worried going. I go away quite a lot, and I don't like to put extra pressure on my family to look after my stuff when I'm away. So I tend to like yeah, tend to turn it off yeah a lot of the time. Or sometimes I'll just run the lights for like three or four hours with the CO2 as well as another option. Yeah. My, I, I know, normally only get my family just to feed the fish when I'm away. And then um, sometimes I'll, depends on the tank. If it's, a, if it's a new tank and I go away and, it, and like the CO2 and light are really important for the initial stages, then I'll get my wife to add fertilizer, you know, and, and keep an eye on everything for me. But yeah, I don't like to put you know too much pressure. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, out yeah, algae needs light, so if you can, yeah, and a and a mature plant, actually quite resilient. You know, you can starve it of light for a little while with with no issue. Whereas algae is a very kind of short short life cycle. So if you starve a plant, if you starve the algae of light, then it normally um, normally dies off common it's a really common method to get rid of um like blue green algae slime algae cyanobacteria 70 72 hour blackout is a really popular way how are we doing for time Whoa. what do you think so when you have the co2 connected to a ph bulb and that's what controls what the co2 is, is that balanced or is that yeah I've, I've never used i've never used one and in my mind i I don't know. I've, I've seen people have good results with it, but I don't think they're necessary. I think they're quite expensive. You need to get the pro calibrated, and and um, yeah, I don't know. Have you got one? Have you? No, I was always wanting to get one, but then I suddenly realised before I could afford it that it, that it kind of got balanced itself. Yeah. I was not on schedule to be yeah. Ten hours a day, and it was the drop checker was rock solid, and I realised that it was kind of controlling itself. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and you know if it if it's not broken, you know don't yeah. fix it sometimes, especially if it kind of costs you a lot of money. So I'm just part planting the the crypt willis eye all down the centre here. So we're using a lot of crypts here. It's going to be a relatively low maintenance uh, tank, although there are going to be some stem plants in a minute, which will require trimming. But they're fast growers, and we want some of those especially in the early days, to help control algae, help limit the risk of algae. Um, the guys here at uh, Finest Aquatics, the guy maintaining it in the long term, if he gets fed up with trimming those plants, he can always replace them with a slower growing plant once the system's mature. I can't remember what the scape looked like last. He was here last year. Were you here? What, do you remember what the scape style was? Was it Iwagumi? <laughs> same as it, probably exactly the same, isn't it? Exactly the Similar, yeah. It's funny how you knew who'd done each one of those tanks yeah. immediately. Like, it's like a language, yeah, you know? It's exactly. like uh, when you do anything enough, it becomes. Yeah, it's intuitive, really. Yeah. Yeah, me and Dan Crawford uh, founded UK Quack Plant Society in 2007. I thought it was something quite a lot of the videos that you set up. Yeah. 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 
Okie dokie, that's the Crip Willisii. Okay, we're going to move on to the one to grow Crip. This is the Undulatus broadleaf. Um, you might remember I said it's very short at the moment, but it's going to potentially grow to this tall. So I'm actually going to put it behind the Albedo Brown. So although it's shorter at the moment, it will, in the longer term, grow much taller. The Albedo Brown is not going to get much taller than it is right now. But this will probably grow twice as tall as the Albedo Brown. So it'll be a nice mid-ground. And then we're finally onto our background stem plants and then our attaching plants or epiphyte plants. Um, all of all of these plants are actually easy category. So strictly speaking, you could argue, yes, they, they'll do okay without CO2. Um, but we are running quite strong lighting here. And the thing is with, um, with lighting and plants, you need, if you have strong lighting, you need CO2 to balance out that strong lighting because the plant is going to want to grow in accordance with how much light there is. So if you've got super intense lighting, the plant's like, yeah, brilliant, I've got all this light. It wants to grow really well, but you haven't got the CO2 to support its growth. If that makes sense. So it's like uh, driving a car. You've got a Ferrari and you, everything's great. You put your foot on, on the gas to go 200 mile an hour, but there's no, not enough fuel in the tank. So it's not going to go very well. Um, and then the problem with uh, having lots of light and not enough plant growth is that you'll just run into algae issues. So a lot of people talk about balance you know, and in a planted aquarium, you know, you're balancing light, CO2, and other nutrients. You know, other nutrients are your liquid fertilizers and your soil, basically. So they, you know, the more the more light you have, the more CO2 you'll potentially need, and the more fertilizers you'll need as well, because the plant needs to be sustain its growth. So the the light is the main driving force, you know. And then, this, then the next most important thing is your CO2. And then the next most important thing is your nutrients. So either nutrients from the soil or nutrients from your liquid fertilizer. So the, the ideal situation is you have good light, good CO2, good fertilizers, good substrate, which is what we've got here today. But if you don't have good, if you, if you don't have CO2 and you... and you want to grow plants healthily, then do not use too much light. But you're just going to be limited by the species. You're going to have to stick to easy category plants. And if you download the Tropica app, you can actually filter all their plant species by category. So you can see what species you can potentially grow. There's easy, uh, medium and advanced, like we chatted about earlier. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I tend to stick with eight-hour photo period normally on most of my tanks. Not sometimes on a start on a startup tank, you know, for, for the first few weeks. Sometimes I'll just sort of add five or six hours. Um, if you've got intense lighting, you can get away with a shorter, shorter photo period. And then if you've got di don't dim lighting, then you might be able benefit from a longer photo period. So, but eight hours is usually my sort of standard and I tend to use plug-in timers you can get smart plugs you know Alexa controlled stuff um, but I like the good old-fashioned mechanical plug-in timer you know does it make an annoying clicking noise yeah the Alexa smart ones when they lose the timing every time they, you know, yeah five minutes. yeah exactly so yeah I'm quite old school in the fact I like um, yeah, the mechanical timers but if you don't have a timer already on your lights, definitely recommend it. They're only a few quid from your local supermarket. And you just guarantee, you know, plants like that stability, they like that consistency. So if you can have the same amount of, you know, light on, same, same time of day, every day, and they get used to that, and then you can really kind of optimise growth. Do you ever dose your fertilisers? Or do you just do it manually? 
I used to use an auto dicer, but I actually like the, you know, I like doing it. Yeah, it's all about like, it's all of, it's all about like engaging with the aquarium, you know, and I like to actually manually do stuff because it's something that you created, and you otherwise you're just like offloading. It's, like, it's not laziness, but it's just. I, I do get it, you know, in complex like reef tanks, for instance, you know, when you're dosing like half a dozen different stuff at different rates, you know, then an auto dose is obviously important. But I'm usually only using one, you know, one or two types of liquid fertilizer. And you know, sometimes, don't tell anyone on this, mm -hmm. but I'll just go, I don't even measure it. Yeah. yeah. I found I had my best results when I started dosing heavily on the Yeah. Yeah, the plants will, um, talk about fertilizers, the plant will actually almost take in as much nutrients as you can throw at it because it has a, an evolutionary thing about, um, it's called luxury uptake, where it will actually take in loads and loads of nutrients. Uh, and I think it's like a, like a survival thing. So in, in times where there's no nutrients, there's a store there. So you, you can literally throw in, you know, two, five, ten times recommended amount and it's normally fine yeah hello yeah yeah i was i yeah 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 okay Uh, well, um, it's quite controversial, but I use a twin star under a hood in mine. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. They, they they told me off. Um, I always do always say a disclaimer. Then you know, there's a potential of overheating and stuff like this. But on my Oase tank, there's a um, it's an aluminium composite hood so it actually conducts the heat away so i have um i mean in a 175 that's actually quite the tall kind of narrow one isn't it the awaze yeah oh you're thinking of the style line the, the high line okay yeah the twin star 600 go nicely in that i reckon yeah yeah the 600 SA, so it's got adjustable arms like these, and then you just you just rotate the arms outward so it lies flat, and then uh, if it blows up, it's not my fault though. <laughs> but the D and D one, he, he's talking about the one with is a D and D one with a hood, not the Aquascaper well, 600 then. Well, the Aquascaper 600 is only yeah. Do you want a bit deeper? Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's deep. Yeah, you'll need four tubes for that then, if you want to grow. Tubes, yeah. yeah. What, what what tubes? I don't know. I don't know. I actually don't know what tubes are available. But if you go for a mix, then that's probably going to give you good results because you're kind of mimicking full spectrum. Yeah. If you, I don't know if they do them. Do they do different colours. Yeah. To, to be honest with you, um, plants are really adaptable to different spectrums of light as long as you stick, as long as you're quite consistent with that light. So don't keep changing it. So once, they, once they've adapted to grow under that light, that spectrum, then they're normally fine. So just do what, do what colour you like the look of, basically, and the plant will adapt. I mean, plants, like I said earlier, they're aquatic weeds. They're very adaptable. If you think about it in nature, you know, they'll grow in all seasons. They'll grow in all, like cloud cover you know, uh, roof, uh, canopy cover from pl other plants. So they have to be quite adaptable. So try not to worry about spectrum. Just think about what you like the look of and what you can afford, basically. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, especially if you want to, well, it depends what scape you want to do. If you want to grow carpeting plants, then absolutely you'll need more light. But if you want to stick with easy epiphyte plants, so they're higher up in the water column, then you can get away with lower lighting.
Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. The other thing with the with a with a really tall tank, it's a nightmare to maintain to get to the bot bottom of the tank as well. Right, you know, it depends what you want. If you want to keep like you know, like depends what fish you want to keep as well. So if you like angel fish, for instance, the tall tank's beautiful, you know. Yeah, so you want to, in my mind, you want to match the aspect ratio. So that's the ratio of the length to the height with the fish you want to keep. So if you if you want to keep like Danios or you know shiners or something that really likes uh, fast flowing water and it's a slender body, then you go for a shallower tank. Yeah, if you want to keep tall bodied fish, you know like you say tetras, like a black widow tetras, you know a taller body tetra, then you want to go for something a bit taller maybe. So if have a have a you know have a think about what you want to keep, what plants you want to grow, the style of scape you want to do, and then match the aquarium to that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Good. Okay, uh, moving on to background plants, and then we're almost there. Um, where, where in the aquarium do you want them? Foreground, background, mid-ground? Oh, yeah. A bit brutal. Yeah, yeah. I'd go, maybe like, um, <clears throat> like a bigger leaf Danubius, like uh, Barteri, the original Barteri. So the leaves are like, this big, yeah. So uh, I think on the the Tropica I call it Anubius barteri variety barteri, um, and you, yeah, eventually the leaves will get that big. There's coffee, Anubius coffee folia as well, which the leaves are beautiful. They have like a real kind of nice um, texture to them, like a V, like a real nice V uh, formation. Uh, but Anubius are, are really hardy, very waxy, very very strong leaves. And they attach to decor. So if you've got any a nice hardscape, yeah. you can just like tie it on with some thread or for super glue. Yeah, we've and got the cotton pad, but we've got like a new big box in there. Yeah. Travel. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's actually perfect because it's the water. Oh, okay. Like yeah, yeah. But Anubius, um, rooted plants. I mean, a mature, a mature crypts are quite robust. Um, that's what we're planting in here. But they take some time to, to adapt and to grow. So might not be suitable for a mature system, but the Anubias, definitely. And Yeah, Anubias and Java fern go really well together. They like the same conditions as well. Yeah, yeah. Cool. You're welcome. Okay, we're going to move on to stem plants at the back now. Where's Gary? <laughs> so we've got two species, uh, both easy again. I think all the species in here are easy. It's great, isn't it? Uh, you could just start doing them, mate, if you want. So the first one here, this is Limnophila hipparoides, uh, very similar to Limnophila aromatica. Actually does smell. My, smells like fragrant. Um, and it's it looks green right now, uh, but once it's adapted to underwater growth and you've got good lighting, which we have today, that's actually going to transform into a beautiful pinky red purple uh, leaf. The leaves will get much more dense, uh, much more kind of elongated, like needles, and it's an absolutely beautiful plant. It just you can't really see how beautiful it is right now because it's in its out of water. Form. It's been grown in the greenhouses again. Uh, exactly the same as before. Separate your rock wool, two halves. And then you can either, depending on how many plants you've got, you could, you could actually plant that as one, you know, in one go if you wanted to. Uh, but I'm going to separate that into two portions to get a bit more coverage. And then this is because it's going to turn into a nice bright, red purple color be nice to kind of put it towards the center what happens is if you have like too much color at the edges 
uh, your eyes are kind of naturally drawn to that high impact color. So they're kind of going left and right. So we tend to put, you know, more colorful stuff towards the center. You talked about the rule of thirds earlier as well. So you could have it offset by about a third. Thank you, mate. So, is it? Yeah, I've learned a lot in the last year. I think um, I think I relied on the plants that were here last time. I had kind of hand selected these, so from you know I took them took them from home. These ones I was actually in the greenhouses um, last week at Tropica. Yeah, yeah. So this is really cool. I don't know if you can. I'm going to get them to pass this round, actually. Yeah, yeah. Denmark, yeah. Um, oh, it's gone. Lots of flowers. There we go. Can anyone see, everyone see that? The little flower? You see it? So this is at this time of year in the greenhouses, the plants will start, a lot of the plants will start flowering out of water. They're grown hydroponically, like I said. And uh, yeah, it's just really beautiful. You see these big trays of plants all growing in the greenhouses, all these little, beautiful little flowers. It's hard to see, kind of, you forget that they're aquatic plants sometimes. You smelt it? Yeah, it smells really nice. It's nice, Especially isn't it? When you're pulling all it smells like uh, it's Calvin Klein 1, you know, CK1. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A bit more citrusy. <laughs> That's what, doing, that's what I'm wearing today, Gary. Do you want to have a seat? No, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mate, please. Yeah. Yeah. It's hinged, but you can take it off. Yeah, yeah. It's like a hinge, and there's uh, two little slots with pins, and you just lift it off. Super. All you want to do, mate, is watch one of my videos. On my YouTube channel, I did a maintenance video on a Oase Highline 400, and I actually talk about the lid in some detail. Yeah. The rim, the actual hood, the rim is. Yeah. No. You just take the lid off, and then it's got that wraparound kind of aluminium thing around it. Yeah. Um, Uh, what the high line? Yeah. Um, no, they are. I've grown plants with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're they're like a daylight spectrum, six and a half thousand Kelvin. I think you come supplied with two, but you can um, put four in there, and that you definitely better grow like any plant then with four. But they're actually really good. I'm not just saying it because I'm an Amazo guy, but they're actually really good uh, tubes. Really good for plant growth. Yeah. I've got two twin stars now in my 400. Yeah. I just I run a, only one on 900 at the back. And then um, a 1200 on for a midday burst. Yeah. Do the twin stars have a sunset molding or can you program? Sort of you, I think you can buy like a third party programmer for them yeah but i don't think it changes the spectrum it's just the photo period yeah nice the ecotechs are nice yeah expensive though aren't they yeah classic reef brand isn't it yeah, well, all things, so I've oh no oh no well yeah yeah okay we're done on the limb the filler towards the center there uh, final stem plant. This is my favourite ever name of a plant. It's brilliant. Uh, Hygrophila coriambosa siamensis 53b. <laughs> Just rolls off the tongue nicely. Um, it's a classic, easy, fast-growing stem plant. Um, it does, once it's adapted, the new growth will be smaller leaves, actually. It'll be a brighter green colour. But it is a, a real fast grower. It responds really well to trimming. 
It's a great plant for uh, the startup phase of a, of a new aquarium. And if the staff here get fed up of maintaining it, they can just replace it with something slower. Rock was really annoying. Mm. You said like it's, it's harmless, but I always find that over time it will always end up floating up. Yeah. The and you have to grab it. Exactly. What you can do is just rip it off. Yeah, like that. There you go. Okay, so it will grow to the surface really quite quickly. Nice bushy effect. Every time you trim it, it will produce two new shoots. So you can really encourage this bushy growth. And then that's just going to go to the to the right and to the left. I actually used this combination of stem plants before in um, in an old escape, uh, my Aquascaper 1200 from a couple of years ago. Probably more than that, actually, what three or four years ago now. Uh, but it's a really nice combination. You've got the bright green of the hygrophila uh, contrasting with the beautiful pinky purple of the limnophila. I think it looks really lovely together. I have. Uh, I did try a planted marine tank with mackerel oh, algae. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. yeah. Uh, did it? Yeah, I did one. Oh, 2009, 10. Um, yeah, it was good. Yeah, just like different cool lurpers, uh, loads of live rock, yeah. and I had a, a small shoal of Bangai cardinals. Oh, they didn't kill each other. No. Yeah, it's nice. Uh, I got bored though. <laughs> And just yeah, now I just stick with fresh water. Yeah. Um, I did have I did I was offered like a bit of a sponsorship thing with um, Aquarium Connections. You know uh, Vince Thomas, he does all the high end installs, Triton yeah. Triton system. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think I just stick with I just love my plants. Yeah. yeah. I think there's something really like I don't know, just really special about plants. You know, like. Without plants, would there be no life on this planet? Because they produce, you know, all the oxygen for us, basically. You know, so when you get to capture that underwater in a little ecosystem, I think it's really special. Yeah. Yeah. Watching, but, the, plant, once, watching the planted tank curl, that's one of the best things. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Whereas with a reef tank, you kind of, it's almost like everything wants to die and you're just stopping everything from dying. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, it just really... Yeah, it's just what it is. I don't think a reef tank looks so natural. It's not got the greens and the you know the the browns of the rock, you know, or the green the browns of the woods and the rocks. It's each to their own, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, right. Finally, uh, a bit of a spray, and then we've got our final plants, attaching plants. No surprises. What I'll be using for those that have been to any of my workshops before. Get a java fern. Now it is grown on wood and rock here, um, but I'm just going to peel it off gently. He says. Got some of that as well. <laughs> um, it's actually really, really well attached to the lava rock, so I'm going to try to sort of disguise the rock. And then just have the plant. There we go. It'll be on this side. So Java fern, Microsorum terrapus, absolutely classic plant. I think they've been available since the 70s. And it's a very easy robust fern as you can see instant impact you can see we've got a focal point right there already i think i can take this one off though yeah. 
here we go. And it does best attached to decor. Uh, the, the leaves grow from a rhizome. The rhizome is this fleshy portion here. If that goes, uh, if that gets devoid of oxygen, so if that if you plant that in the soil, it can often die off, rot away, and die. So that's why we attach them to the to the decor. Uh, you can glue them on, tie them on with thread, or if you're a bit lazy like me, you can just wedge wedge it in somewhere appropriate. Uh, I know it looks quite symmetrical, but it's not too symmetrical. Let's, let's put it there. Hmm. There we go. Lovely. Okay, finally. Final plant, one of my favorites of all time. I've got loads of this growing in my 400 litre tank at home. This is Anubius Petite. It's one of the smaller forms of Anubius. Uh, Tropica now do another even smaller form called Mini Coin, uh, which is limited edition, but it will be in full time production soon, I think. And again, this is an epiphyte plant or an attaching plant. Uh, we can separate that into, into more individual portions, but I think for impact, it would be nice just to use these clumps, like so. So this is a, it does like the shade. It will get covered, it will tend to get more algae on it if you plant it too near the lighting. So I'm just going to position it more towards the, the bottom of the aquarium. There's a nice little section here. And eventually that will just, the roots and the rhizome will creep and attach themselves really securely to the rock or the wood. And it's just a very slow grower. You know, you're talking probably one leaf per month or so. If a CO2 injection might be a bit quicker. It doesn't need CO2 injection. It certainly doesn't need a lot of light. I prefer to keep it in lower light conditions because it is so slow growing, it isn't demanding at all. You could do, yeah. I mean, um, what sort of, depends what type of algae it is as well to an extent, yeah. Um, sometimes it's just inevitable yeah. and it's something you have to learn to live with. Because um, if you do, obviously, if you dial the di light too much down, then the other plants will suffer. So you're always trying to like, you know, when you have a variety of species in a tank, you know, you're always going to get one species that's not going to do so well as the others, maybe. Um, but it does do, I, I find it does very well. <laughs> In lower levels of lighting with CO2 and good circulation. Uh, I find that produces really kind of slow and steady growth that's not almost algae free. Yeah. Almost there.
Tell you what, I'm going to actually split this into two. And then a bit here. And another bit. There. Cool. Let's straighten this up a bit. <clears throat> Okie dokie. So that's it. That's the aquascape fully planted. Um, we're not going to fill with water. It's going to be uh, manhandled upstairs, uh, filled up there, filter CO2 fitted. Um, maintenance wise, I'd be recommending them to the guys here to be doing at least uh, three 50% water changes in the first week, um, for the first couple of weeks. And then you can go down to two, two water changes after that uh, per week. And then after a month or so, one, you can go down to one water change a week. But 50%, uh, I would normally do once a week after that. And then feed uh, liquid fertilizer every day, uh, specialized nutrition from Tropica, or any of the other all-in-one fertilizers, you're probably looking to start with um, at least five millilitres a day in here. And then keep an eye on all the plants, look out for signs of any melting. Uh, some of the crypts may melt, um, that's okay. Just remove that leaf and then it will produce new growth from the rootstock. The carpet plants should hopefully just kind of creep nice and naturally across over time. The ferns and the anubias, require virtually no maintenance for many months it's so slow growing and then the stems at the back the limnophila and the hygrophila uh, hopefully they'll grow really fast that's what we want because that's going to help prevent the algae and they'll need to be trimmed as appropriate you know, with the cuttings you can replant um, or you can uh, throw them away responsibly if you ever uh, get rid of aquatic plants uh, make sure you get rid of them properly. Do not just dispose of them any old way because they can get into natural uh, waterways and cause um, uh, lots of invasive uh, devastation. So really, be really, really careful when you're disposing of aquatic plants in particular. Uh, Fish-wise, uh, you can put fish in here after sort of three, four weeks. I'd definitely get an army of Amano shrimp or cherry shrimp or both in there. Uh, maybe some otosynclus. I wouldn't put autosynclus in there for a couple of months until you've got some kind of high levels of uh, natural background algae. Autosynclus are quite fragile. They need a lot of, uh, you know, a mature system with some natural kind of microorganisms and, and algae in there. Uh, but shrimp you can put in there almost immediately. And then display fish. I know it's, it seems quite, it's quite an Asian heavy aquascape. Most of the plants here are from Asia. So I like to kind of keep it a little bit thematic habitat wise. So maybe um, maybe some Harlequin rosboras that match nicely with the orange. Um, maybe some barbs to keep it a bit more active, essentially. Um, yeah, quite a lot of stocking options for this. It's quite a large aquarium, you know, looking at 250 litres or so. Uh, so yeah, I probably would avoid I would tend to avoid too much ground dwelling fish in a soil based tank because quite a light soil can tend to uh, cut cloud up if you get digging fish, etc. But yeah, nice, simple, uh, basic kind of nature aquarium, you know, classic hardscape, wood rocks, foreground, mid ground, background plants, attaching plants. Yeah, hopefully you've learned something and enjoyed it. I've loved bringing it to you. So thank you for watching. Thank you. Cheerio, YouTube fan. Thanks, Josh. Appreciate that, mate.